Majority Report with Sam Cedar, where every day is Casual Friday. That means Monday is Casual Monday, Tuesday, Casual Tuesday, Wednesday, Casual Hump Day, Thursday, Casual Thurs, that's what we call it, and Friday, Casual Shabbat, The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. It is Friday. September 9th, 2022. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, the host of the Benjamin Dixon Show, Ben Dixon, will be here with us. To look back on the week that was. Also on the program today, Matthew Film Guy. To give us a couple of suggestions for films to watch this weekend. In the wake of the Oscars. Or preceding the Oscars. Sometime at the same time of a year in which the Oscars were issued. I have no idea. Meanwhile, the Department of Justice appeals the Trump special master ruling, reminding the judge they're not Trump's documents. Says you. (laughs) Federal grand jury issues subpoenas investigating Trump's Save America PAC. And Steve Bannon surrenders to Manhattan prosecutors over fraud charges. He'll always have Seinfeld, folks. Michigan Supreme Court says abortion rights state constitutional amendment must be on the ballot in November in Michigan. Meanwhile, new report food insecurity hit a two decade low in 2021. But as a country, we've decided to abandon that policy change. As Ukraine forces have success in a major offensive The eastern part of the country, Washington, readies another $675 million in weapons. Democratic National Committee panel blocks a vote on a resolution to ban dark money in Democratic primaries. Neil Gorsuch says the Supreme Court leaker investigation will issue a public report someday. And a uh, new climate change research shows that Florida, Texas, Louisiana, and North Carolina face massive tidal risks by 2050. All this and more on today's Majority Report. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for joining us. It is Casual Friday. As you can see, if you're watching us on the computer or maybe on your TV by any device uh, possible, you will notice that I am wearing a soft collared shirt as is my tradition on casual Fridays. Uh, Today is so casual that uh, Emma is not here. I don't know if she just didn't, she just didn't roll out of bed today or what? I don't know what's going on, but uh, she will be back on Tuesday, right? Um, If uh, you see me wincing in pain, Please know that uh, at softball last night, it's been a couple months because the game moved out too far out into Brooklyn. I couldn't get there, but uh, resumed last night. I played great, Uh, and I just decided in the last play of the game to spare a smaller player the full force of uh, one of my cleats going into his chest as he tried to slide past me into third base. He did not succeed. And I got the last out of the game and then uh, felt a pop at the back of my hamstring, and I'm in incredible pain. Those emergency breaks are how you pull hamstrings. Yep, that's what happened there. I I probably saved that guy's life. I mean, honestly, he should probably thank you and maybe pay for any sort of therapy that you need. No kidding. No kidding. 
He's a little bit older than I am, and he is, I think, probably like half my size. And um, it would have been a disaster for him, but I, I put, I put him uh, in front of the, my uh, functioning hamstrings. So uh, there's that. Um, we got a couple of things I could play right off top. Um, maybe we'll do the, let's do this one first, and then maybe we'll do the Bannon one. Um, you may not be aware of this, but apparently the Queen of England passed away yesterday on my day off. A lot of people are making a lot to do with that. It would have been virtually impossible for me to make it uh, all the way uh, to uh, to England and back. Unless the Concorde is still flying. Unless, unless, unless I have my own Concorde, which I may have been keeping out at Peterborough Air uh, Strip out in New Jersey uh, for such uh, for such things. Uh, she is 96 and apparently a queen of this country. Not this one, but a country. Um, I got to be honest with you. I don't have strong feelings about it one way or another. I, um, the most interesting thing about, about the queen passing on is that it reminds you that we once, as a world, lived, and, and there's still some, who do in, in societies where the government was a family that was anointed by God, according to them, to rule other, other people. This is going to be relevant when we talk to Ben, um, ben Dixon, who is um, starting to work on the, the problem that we have with, with Christian nationalists in this country. But, but if, you, if you understand that the um, fundamental building block of monarchy, which is really also like sort of just oligarchy, but, but narrower in some ways, less democratic than an oligarchy, was the legitimacy of that type of government, for lack of a better word, was simply founded on a on on religious fundamentalism and all of the hierarchies that we have are derived ultimately from that but aside from that i'm not super super interested in it but um in many respects i could relate to this woman let's see this need some sound this is uh cnn in um uh, walking around, I guess, uh, Windsor. in Windsor and uh, looking for people who, I, I don't know, like, what do you think about the queen die? I mean, she's 96. Like, it, it really, the story is like, why is she still alive? How is she held on so long? <laughs> exactly. But go ahead. She lives here in Windsor. And I just wonder what you thought, what your first reaction was when you heard the news that uh, the queen is under medical supervision. Um... I mean, I think it's pretty sad, like, when anyone kind of gets in that position, like, you wouldn't want that to happen to your own family member. Um, but I, I'm not, like, the biggest fan of the Queen or just, like, the monarchy in general, so I wasn't, like, that upset or overwhelmed by it. It was just something that happens, I guess. You're not the biggest fan of, of the monarchy. I wonder why. Um, mainly to do with, like, British, like, colonial history things like that a lot of things that have gone on which have been quite shady even like recently with like prince andrew and everything so um yeah i'm not really that biggest fan fair enough it was nice talk nice talking to you yeah um, I bet. there's a couple of americans over here as well who are on holiday here from cleveland and i just wonder uh what did you guys think uh, when you first heard heard the news that uh, the queen is under medical supervision well, we were surprised here we are on a holiday and then all of a sudden all this hubbub comes which is you know kind of different dynamic for your typical tourism day I, I wonder what your perception is of the queen more generally um i think you know, she's an amazing woman i mean if you think what she has seen in her lifetime and what she's dealt with nationally globally family and she's kept a level head um and she's 90 yeah i mean uh she's seen um Oh, I mean, folks die in Africa because of like, uh, in a way, it's amazing. It, it, I mean, 
Look, it's I one can I I, I mean put aside the fact that she's 96 because it is I mean it is amazing what a, someone who has lived for 100 years has seen. That is really extraordinary, right? And particularly like these 100 years. Anytime over the past 150 years, really anybody who's lived for 100 years has seen incredible the 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 pace of change. Um you know, as cars to, were new. Well, I mean, radios, TVs, cars, computers, video cameras. I mean, it is. Uh, you, that's amazing. I mean, I remember my grandmother said to me she she lived to about 101 and she like I, I she she wanted me to shoot some video at uh, one of the like at Passover, one of the Jewish holidays, you know, with my uh, great uncle who was there. We ended up living to 104 and this and that. And she and she must have done it because she knew there wasn't much time left for for her generation to to be there. And so she for the first time ever, I remember her like being interested in like me shooting some video. And then she kept asking me, like, did it come out? And I'm like, well, no, I mean, it, it, it I knew it came out the moment, like just the idea, the jump from from. 16 millimeter film, which of course didn't exist like widely until like, I don't know, like I, maybe late twenties, thirties, like I, I, to, to video was just a massive, like almost conceptually impossible to understand. But the fact that she was queen, like, I don't know, man. Um, I guess it might've been difficult for her to step down at one point and say, but I appreciated how much she really sort of like, embarrassed her son by not relinquishing the the uh the, the the throne because she didn't have confidence in him be able to go around and cut ribbons and be rich i'm not sure sort of like a when barbara bush came out and said like i'm not sure jeb should really be running <laughs> but aside from that like i don't know um if charles wants to make a big like bold move I would suggest saying we're going to abolish it instead of like, instead of like King Charles, we're just going to put it into our middle names. So yeah, Charles King of Windsor. I don't know. What's, what's his last name? I don't even know what his last name is. Uh, that stuff is so confusing because I, I don't get it. it changes and stuff. He, so it's, you know, like William, I think wants to be King, but he just could change his middle name to King. Like they'll all be that just do it that way. I don't know. But um, if you're if you're uh, British and you're upset at the, the passing of her, then my condolences. But, uh, you know, maybe you guys should work on this. It's, we it's weird how infantilizing it is because you see somebody on like cable news saying she was their like grandmother. She was their constant. And it's like, well. No, that wasn't exactly what she was. Like my grandmother, <laughs> doesn't, that's not like a grandmother to me is where well, you control half the world. Well, the, the problem is she not was really. like a grandmother to some people, but she was something far, Scarier. far more problematic to a lot of other people. <laughs> right. um, I still remember uh, meeting a guy from Mauritius in uh, uh, undergrad in Minnesota and uh and it, the topic of the monarchy came up and he was very anti-monarchy. And that was the first time I saw, I heard that sort of actually vocalized by somebody. And it, it, I'm, I'm hoping Dom, you're doing well today. I mean, it's not hard to, f to hear that if you talk to people whose resources have been pillaged, uh, over the years in the name of the monarchy. Um, but, uh, so, uh, I, I guess rest in peace. I mean, I don't know. People are talking about it. Honestly, if it if if it wasn't, it, it, I I could have easily just missed the whole thing. <laughs> Honestly, that's your alibi. Yep. <laughs> no, I don't want to start any rumors that I was involved in that whatsoever. I was waiting until she got a little bit older so I could take her. No, would have been too hard. I went in their 80s. She was too, still too feisty. Hey, folks, today's episode is sponsored by Sunset Lake Sabaday. But they have something special. I don't have my, my bottle with me because I brought it home uh, the other day and have already uh, really, really dug deep into that bottle. 
Um, they have a new product, the Good Vibe Gummies. It is a full-spectrum gummy crafted with a blend of CBD and hemp-derived THC. You don't know which uh, letters are problematic, but I think people know. Each Good Vibe Gummy is infused with three milligrams of THC. And you don't get really heady off it at all. Um, and 30 milligrams of say by day. Good vibe gummies are perfect for taking the edge off a long day or relaxing with friends and family. Uh, Sunset Lake say by day is spreading the good vibes by offering you ready for this 30% off of all gummies. So that includes their famous sleep gummies. I think we have some over there. Those uh, go faster on the office here. Yes. The, with the melatonin and is it like Blackberry? What is it? I think it's if no. I'm it's not, not blackberry. It's boysenberry, maybe. It's it, yeah. It's a dark purple. Yeah, uh, but there's some. There's some over there. They're fabulous, though. Uh, they're they're great. Stuff. Also, the uh, sour gummies are great. And um, I'll just re- remind you that uh, tasse that is derived from hemp, because it's 03 uh, percent, is uh, perfectly legal. That's the way that they can ship that and and do that. So. Uh, starting uh, just the other day, actually, Wednesday, all Sebade gummies are 30% off with the coupon code Good Vibe. It's one word. Good Vibe gummies are made from the full spectrum CBD oil. And uh, Sunset Lakes Hemp Farm can be delivered anywhere in the U.S. Um, the beginning of school for younger children can be tumultuous, particularly in the Cedar household. I will tell you <laughs> that um, I was I brought these home as in an attempt to sleep, uh, and I ended up taking uh, multiple ones uh, in the process of trying to get my child to sleep the night before uh, school started, and the night before uh, school was the second day. And they were very effective in me being able to sort of calmly say, "Yes, you are going to school. Yes." You are going to school. No, you cannot have the second day you're off, back from school off. <laughs> they helped big time. Uh, Sunset Lake Sabade, of course, as you know, is a majority employee-owned business. They pay a minimum wage of 20 bucks an hour. In 2021, Sunset Lake Sabade donated more than $25,000 to anti-drug war organizations, animal shelters, union strike funds, nature conservation, food shelves, refugee resettlement organizations, give directly, uh, a real movement partner, great company. And all of their products have incredible integrity. we got a stack of uh, documents that you get when they uh, send you uh, products. It's completely uh, broken down and give you a sense of what's in there. Again, um, as of today, until um, September 12th, all Sabade gummies, 30% off with coupon code GOODVIBE. Visit sunsetlakesabaday.com and try these amazing new products. Take advantage of the sale while it lasts. Believe me, you want to try these out. They're also delicious, which I think is a little bit tricky for me. They are good. Um, all right. Let's take a quick break. When we come back, we'll be talking to Ben Dixon.
We are back. Sam Cedar on the Majority Report on the, uh, well, joining us on the show. I still haven't figured out what to call this. Uh, joining us on the ping, uh, really, uh, is uh, Ben Dixon. He is the proprietor of the Benjamin Dixon Show, uh, among others. Uh, ben, always good to see you. Sam's always a pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. So, all right, let's, I want to play this, this video of yours that I saw. Um, this is, I think it was on Instagram, right? Is this an Instagram yeah. video? Uh, uh, it's, well, you know, basically everywhere, uh, social yeah. media. Social I guess maybe media I saw it on Instagram. Or maybe it's on YouTube. I can't remember. Yeah. But um, here it is. And uh, this is a good introduction to um, the, uh, something that uh, you've been, you started to focus on. Uh, play this. This are going viral for stuff like this. You name it, Gucci, Louis, you name it. Or this. Beyonce just released Church Girl. Or even worse, this. And y'all know I asked for one last year. Here it is the whole way in August. I still ain't got it. Meanwhile, Christian nationalist pastors are preaching sermons of hate like this. You cannot be a Christian and vote Democrat in this nation. I don't care how mad that makes you. You get pissed off as you want to. They're calling for violence. Every single homosexual in our country, they should be sentenced with death. They should be lined up against the wall and shot in the back of the head. And don't think for a second that just because you're a Christian that nationalism is not going to come after you. I am sick and tired of allowing black people to get away with calling themselves Christians and they're just black. Christian nationalism is the religion of white supremacy. They have colonized Christ, they've gentrified Jesus, and now they're trying to tell us that what we need to do is to be a country that worships the God of Marjorie Taylor Greene. When black pastors are going viral okay. for- That's it. Um, all right. Uh, le uh well, le uh, I want you to give an overview, but I also yeah. like on some level that, you know, you say they're colonizing Christ and they're, I mean, it, it seems to me that, um, there have been strands of Christianity, sometimes bigger strands than others mm -hmm. yeah. that have, that have like, uh, have justified colonization. Oh yeah. Um, and, yeah. and, and, you know, I mean, I, I, I'm not, I don't have a problem with, uh, religion writ large. I have a problem with fundamentalism in many respects. That's right. Um, That's right. and uh, I, I remember, uh, Desmond Tutu, uh, telling Janine Groffo and I, uh, back in the day on, uh, on a different version of this show that, uh, he saw religion as like a, a knife. You can either use it to spread butter or you can use it to stab somebody. Mm. Um, yeah. and, uh, the, uh, th we've got a lot of people who are using it to stab people. Uh, um, right. I right. mean, but let's talk specifically in this country. I mean, uh, 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 put us, uh, put Christian nationalism in context for us. You know, I think Christian nationalism, not think I'm confident that Christian nationalism is, the religion of white supremacy. That's the underlying factor that separates any other version of it. You mentioned fundamentalism. I, I take what I'm doing right now akin to what we always said, you know, uh, it was gonna take moderate and progressive Muslims to take care of threats like ISIS. I see Christian nationalists in this country who are organizing not just for the white supremacy of it, but they're also organizing to overthrow the government. I mean, they have a dominionist theology and that theology means that their version, their specific version of Christianity, which as you said, uh, uh, Sam, it definitely has been used in history to, to not only justify, but to implement slavery, Jim Crow, and colonization. And that is the version of Christianity that they want to enshrine in power with the force of law. And as you can see in that video, where the one young guy said he wants to execute uh, LGBTQ members of the uh, community. Well, I, do we have a sense of like how many, what, what the numbers are on this in this country? I mean, I know that we have we have a lot of people who self ID as, uh, evangelicals, right. Mm -hmm. And these are all not ne necessarily Christian nationalists, mm -hmm. but the, right. it feels like they take their cues from right. these people. I mean, what, can you give us some like breakdown as to like, wh like what we're dealing with here? Well, we're looking at a, a form of commitment that is, to the level of idol worship. And I use that specifically to help give us context of the threat. The same people who worship the golden image of Donald Trump, 
the same people. And, and I mean that literally, I don't mean that rhetorically. Like there was the golden cap image of Donald Trump that people lined up at a convention to take pictures with. And we see that there's a faction of the Republican party that no matter what, they will go all the way with Donald Trump. And so if I'm just going to, of course, this is a guesstimate, but they do have at least 30% of the Republican party right now, because that's usually the baseline for Donald Trump. Now that said, what makes them so dangerous that even though they're small group, they're a very vocal minority that's able to maneuver between all of the factions of the Republican Party. And that's where they get their strength from. So the real question is, is not so much what are their numbers, but where are the other evangelical pastors who know better, who know that these are basically false prophets who are using their own dogma and fundamentalism to hurt? Where, where are those evangelical pastors who are going to fight against them? Well, where are they? I mean, are, are they afraid of of their own? Are they afraid of their own congregations? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would say most certainly they would be because their livelihoods depend on them uh, continuing to appease their audiences. And this is something, Matt. Uh, uh, I keep wanting to say Matt, but uh, Sam, this is something that we see in our independent media when your audience begins to demand a particular message that audience has the ability to control you as a quote unquote leader. And it's the same thing that's happening in some of these churches. Now, mind you, you have the Franklin Grahams of the world who are more than happy, uh, the Jerry Falwell Juniors of the world who are more than happy to go out there and assert their belief in someone like Donald Trump, whether or not their congregation is asking for it. Um, I, I can't remember who it is. We had him on here. He had written a biography about uh, uh, Pence. And he and 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 this was uh, you know six years ago now maybe uh, five years ago, he said that Pence was the most powerful theocrat ever to hold office in in uh, in the United States, uh, got to vice president, and, and in many respects he delivered a lot of this vote for Donald Trump. I think it was Michael D'Antonio. Yeah. Okay, that's it. And um, and he said you know uh, Pence full on theocrat. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, so what, I mean, is there a way to like reverse this trend or is it just a question of like, okay, we got to beat them and that's it. End of story. They're, they're going to exist as long as they exist. And, um, that rather than try and fight and sort of like, I don't know, uh, reappropriate Christianity mm -hmm. for the good stuff, uh, or at least, you know, change their perspective on their own religion, is is the answer just more to like just beat them at the ballot box? <laughs> Well, uh, you know, I think it's all the above. We absolutely have to beat them at the ballot box. You know, there's a you and I, we understand the frustration of supporting the Democratic Party. Um, but, you know, Joe Biden has had a couple of wins. All of that aside, we cannot afford to let this dominionist branch of the Republican Party cement their control by winning the midterm. So we have to do that. Number two, we have to re we have to capture the supply and redirect the demand. And what I mean by that, that there is a better version of Christianity if anybody actually cares, right? I know this, we don't want to make it a conversation about uh, atheism and Christianity or belief in general, but there are a lot of people of good faith who have all types of beliefs. And as I'm organizing with Christian pastors, particularly black pastors, I'm also organizing with universalists. I'm organizing with, it's an ecumen ecumenical movement of people who have different beliefs, but at the core, we all believe that we have to coexist. I think that has to be a two-part, uh, two-pronged approach. And so what does that organizing look like? I mean, what do you what do you what do you actually do? You know, right now I'm going across the South in particular because the South is a stronghold both for the evangelical church, but also for the black church. I'm speaking with particularly black pastors. And then those pastors are connecting me a little bit deeper in the community uh, with some of their ecumenical partners, some of the imams, uh, a couple of rabbis. Uh, and then some communities of non-belief. So we're, we're having a great opportunity to talk with these pastors and actually see where they stand. And, and I honestly think every person should ask their pastor if they have one, where do they stand on Christian nationalism? Because it's not only a threat to our faith, which is a tribal issue, but it's also a threat to this country, which is a national issue. Well, uh, how, how acutely do people feel that? Like when you go around and talk to some of these pastors, are they like, what? Or are they like, yes, uh, we let's go into the other room. I don't want to talk about this. Out in the <laughs> it depends on who you get. But uh, honestly, the, the video that uh, it's, it's going viral now uh, that you shared, and I appreciate that. 
um, that it's kind of a juxtaposition that shocks people into reality. Um, it's hard for some black pastors, and I, I, I do want to give them a lot of respect because every community that I've gone into so far, it's not that they're not paying attention because they're not doing anything. They're literally preoccupied with a full on assault in the black community. Every city I've gone to, black pastors are dealing with all of the problems in the community. Jackson, Mississippi, for example, one of the cities, uh, and we all know the problems that they have there. Um, but generally speaking, once they see that there's a dual threat, there's what's happening on the local level, but there's also what's happening on the national level. And once we bring it to their attention, they're ready to go to work. Yeah, but what does that mean, though? Go to work. Like, what are they? I mean, they're not talking to the same people, right? It's not like the people coming into their pew are, um, uh, you know, are they wouldn't be there if if they were interested in, 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 in that type of, of Christianity. Right. But see, this is this is the two pronged approach. Right. So the one of the most powerful and influential positions in the black community is the black church, which is why you have politicians who only show up around election time. We could do better than that. We deserve better than that. That said, pastors have the ability to organize their congregations to get out the vote. So that goes without saying. The second part is them actively getting involved and holding their colleagues accountable. This is going to require speaking up. Somebody needs to call Greg Locke out. Somebody needs to call uh, Robert Jeffries out, someone who has the platform of that magnitude. And while we're dealing with pastors who are important in their community, we're, we have not yet connected with national level pastors who have that kind of authority to call these people out the way they need to. But that's the goal. So it's two pronged. We're organizing against internally holding these preachers and pastors accountable with their colleagues. And then those pastors are organizing their congregations to get out and vote. I, I, you know, it, it just seems so, um, it seems timely uh, right yeah. now. Um, but, you know, it's funny because in 2000, you know, four and five and six, certainly this is when we talked about the Republican party, we were talking about, Christian fundamentalism, and it yeah. sort of seemed to go away, or at least present itself in a different way. I mean, it felt like during the teens, Christian fundamentalists, the early teens, Christian fundamentalists just sort of laid low. Um, you know, you had the ascendant, you had marriage equality, they attempted to push back on that, they failed, and it became, you know, sort of widely adopted. And now there's this sort of resurgence. What do you, at least in terms of like in public, like what, what accounts for that? Was there like an awareness, do you think, amongst these people that we can't be this explicit? Because I mean, in 2006, I wrote a book that where it was just so obvious how prominent uh, this type of fundamentalism, Christian nationalism and dominionists were mm. at, on the scene. And, and part of that, I think, was because George W. Bush was like activating them. Uh, in the 2004 election because he wanted uh, them to come out and vote for him. So there was a lot of like attempts to put marriage equality on state constitutional ballots. Yeah. I think in, like maybe half a dozen uh, states around the country. And then it really did feel like in the wake of Obama's election, uh, it was almost as if like, we don't have to be mm. Christian nationalists in public, we can just sort of slide into maybe some racism right. and That's right. we don't need to like push that part of ourselves. I don't know. Yeah. What, what, like, How do you account for this? So, you know, you mentioned um, the former vice president and, uh, you know, the thing about it is while he's the most powerful forward facing theocrat, there is a new sheriff in town for lack of a better phrase. Um, and I don't even think the Republicans know who it is. It, it, it's a type of religion that does not care about institutions because George W. Bush and uh, the rest of that cabal, they were Christian nationalists, but you're right. They pushed it into the background enough not to have to take us into the handmaid's tale. Now, don't get me wrong, we're clearly headed that way now. So what's the difference? You hit it on the head. When Barack Obama became president, the Republican Party did away with institutionalism altogether. They utilized institutionalism in the Supreme Court in 2000 to take over. That was the first step of the coup. But once they realized they couldn't even do that, they couldn't do that to control this country. They totally just dispelled with it. And now they are allowing their their under they're allowing the most ridiculous part of their cabal 
the Marjorie Taylor Greens of the world. Uh, they're, they're allowing them to run this bus, to run this classroom. And I really think that they're going to realize that there's nobody at the head of the class uh, except complete destruction. Um, let's talk a little bit about what's happening in, in Georgia. I know you're from there and, and like, uh, you know, I think, I, I guess, you know, just, I, just to, to sort of wrap up that, the, 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 the part of what you're doing, I think like the, the more exposure these, um, uh, Christian nationalists get, I think the better it is for people to understand what's happening with our politics. I and mean, if you look yeah. at like the entire Republican agenda, Going into the midterms, we it is this sort of vague notion of 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 Joe Biden being uh, the next Hitler, which is really just an extension of January six, right? I mean, right. Because if you believe that like Joe Biden sat atop a massive uh, election fraud. And that uh, Donald Trump was really elected president, but Joe Biden is sitting there. It's not a huge leap to say like, oh, this guy's like Hitler, Um, (laughs) A, because you may not know history, but uh, it just fits in well, like, of course. Um, But aside from that, everything else is just full on culture war. It's all I mean, it's it's, you know, transgenderism is at this sort of like the the tip of the spear for these folks. But but, you know, that is. uh, backfilled with sort of like the, the reemergence of of anti-gay, uh, you know, uh, sentiment and homophobia um, and the idea of like, you know, marriage equality, which apparently there's going to be a vote in the Senate on uh, maybe September 19th. They're talking about unclear whether the Republicans will filibuster it. A lot of it's going to come down to Ron Johnson. We got a good clip of him, you know, pretending that we don't need this because of Supreme court president, which I think uh, is a really inopportune time to make that point uh, this year. (laughs) Um, But um, this seems to be almost the entirety of the Republican agenda at this point. Yeah. Is if not explicit Christian fundamentalism uh, and, and, and and really theocracy on some level, like I, I don't, I don't, you know, it's, it's just basically Trump is, you know, like Trumpist, yeah. like, like just worship for that one guy as a vessel from God or yes. just like, you know, uh, uh, fundamentalism. Like there's no, right. they're not even bothering with like deficit reduction. You know, they like they've thrown out all of the accoutrements. You know, the, the Republican party for some time has had to be um, the party of betraying their own beliefs the party that would oppose Obamacare, even though it's something from Mitt Romney and the Heritage Foundation, the party that would blame, uh, talk about the deficit, yet do everything to exacerbate it whenever they're in office. So the Republican Party, in order to maintain power, their strategy has been they'll flip on a dime. It doesn't matter what the issue is. If they believed it before, they will disbelieve it now in order to maintain power. The only thing that matters to them is power. And they've lost the ability to get in a mass power democratically. So they have to get rid of democracy. And the only way they can justify and assert some type of authority to do that is if they now not appeal to we the people, but they appeal to Christian dominionism. Because my branch of Christianity doesn't support any of the mess that's coming out of the evangelical church right now. All right. Well, let's 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 turn to um, uh, stuff that's a little bit, um, you know, I mean, it, w- what you're talking about is a long term project. And, and like I say, yeah. I I, um, I don't know how you're going to do in terms of uh, winning the battle for Christianity. But at the very least, I think you're going to be able to um, help clarify for people like, you know, the answer, like what 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 where is the Republican agenda coming from? Well, to be sure, I'm not. I, that's a battle that's much bigger than me. I'm not in this to win the heart and the soul of Christianity in this country. I'm in this to stop the dominionists that are trying to overthrow democracy starting in this November. So there's really attainable goals is to chase all the traitors out of the temple. And to do that, we need everyone to vote. That's the first move. The long term project. You know, let's talk in another 10 years to see how that's going. How much have you uh, dug into this Oath Keepers leak? I mean, I, I, I'm just starting to, to look into this. There was a massive um, leak or hack, I guess, of uh, some Oath Keeper like, emails and this and that. And people around the country are starting to find out that like, oh, my local judge and uh, half the police force is a member of the Oath Keepers, which is a, 
I, I, how would you describe them? Like a militant, like, uh, like almost like a Christian nationalist paramilitary sort of. That's right. That's exactly right. Think of them as black water, but from the backwater, you know, from the local pubs. And this is not to insult them. I'm a country boy myself, but, you know, we really have to make sure people understand that Southern, and it's not even just in the South, but I've seen a huge presence of them. Um, and organizations like the three percenters. Um, and then their younger brothers, the, the proud, the proud boys, they're all really part and parcel of the same ideology, which is the militarized Christian nationalism. Um, let's talk a little bit about Georgia. Um, I know you've been traveling a bit, but there, there are two stories coming out of Georgia that, um, are not necessarily uh, unrelated. Um, first being that Kemp uh, seems to be widening his lead over Abrams. Mm. Um, Walker seems to be gaining, if not, you know, statistically, maybe, maybe a point or two, even ahead of Warnock right now. Um, and then <laughs> George's biggest County, apparently cannot find anybody to run their elections because you know, at, at like 170 grand a year, uh, because they're terrified of, of like all the, um, sort of election deniers. Yeah. Um, first off, what's going on in Georgia with Kemp and Abrams and, and Warnock and Walker? Like I, you know, for, I, I look at Herschel Walker and I just think, how is it possible that this guy could get elected? Like yeah. Donald Trump, uh, may be an idiot, but at least like he was like, he had a shtick. Walker. Yeah. I, 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 yeah. I, I I don't know. Do you see something different going on there or what? We're, we're, we're at the bottom of the barrel now for the Republican Party. Uh, all due respect to that black man. Um, he needs to go and get some help for uh, probably CTE. He's been hit across the head so many times. He can't string together a coherent sentence. But that does put him in the likes, along the likes of Marjorie Taylor Greene uh, and the rest of them who are essentially the representation from the village idiot delegation. And so they absolutely are okay with this because the Republican party has been on a, on a race to the bottom, at least since Sarah Palin. I mean, there are no yep. William, William F. Buckley's out there anymore. And so now they're stuck with whatever they can get. And that's because they have an ideology that has no grounding, no footing. They only care about power. And now we're down to the people who are useful idiots enough to carry out the, the will of these theocratic fascists. So I said a whole lot of words, but at the end of the day, they're getting exactly what they want and what they need is a whole bunch of dummies who are willing to go up there and say nothing against the people like Kemp. People like Kemp, who is betraying democracy, he betrayed democracy back in 2018 by purging so many African-American voters to make sure that he won power. So it's it's a twofold attack. It is an idiocracy that we can laugh about and make fun of, but these people are doing the bidding of people who have no regard for the institutions, they will overthrow democracy. And that's part of the equation. Well, what's, what's going on with these polls? I, now, now granted, this is a, um, uh, I'm getting this from Fox five Atlanta, uh, poll. It's an insider advantage, Fox five. I don't know. Insider advantage. Uh, it is a, um, 4.2% margin of error, which is, you know, up there. And it's also, uh, uh, likely voters and. Hmm. <laughs> polls of likely voters is a tricky thing to measure in this yeah. environment. And it's been like that for, for a bunch of years. Um, but do you have a sense again, I know you've been on the road quite a bit, but do you have a sense of like, are we going to see bigger numbers than, you know, one would suspect from a uh, democratic turnout? I mean, Abrams has had uh, several years to build this machine and we certainly right. saw it in that runoff of those two Senate races. But right. I mean, w what's your sense? And, and is abortion playing like in Georgia the way that it is other places? Yeah, it most certainly is. And, you know, shout out to everyone who's on the ground organizing and have not stopped. And these are organizations like Stacey Abrams, uh, Black Male Voter Project, the George New Georgia Project, all those people who have organized relentlessly. What we're up against, though, is an equal and opposite reaction. There are people in the evangelical movement who believe that this decision about Roe versus Wade is worth them going out for. They're excited because of that. So where we have people who are excited to go out and 
reinstated to fight back against against it. You have the opposite reaction from evangelicals in Georgia. They believe that this upcoming election is a referendum on faith. So they don't care who's on the ballot. As long as it's not a godless leftist or a godless liberal, they're going to be excited about it and they're going to the polls. So I think it's just going to be a competition of turnout. Who is actually going to go out to the polls? Yeah. Um, and it is hard to, it's hard to assess. It just feels really hard to assess right now, particularly with abortion in there. And then, you know, um, I, I, I think we're going to see a couple more hearings of January 6th and with, uh, I, uh, Trump could declare, uh, I mean, I don't know how much you've been following the, the news of for today, Steve Bannon going in defra mm. yeah, on fraud. He, of course, had federal charges on this, but he was pardoned by Donald Trump. And, and, and to be clear, this is the case where he was part of this. Um, well, let's play this clip of, of Bannon. This is actually, you know, we got two clips of, uh, of Bannon. But let, let's go. This is 2020 when Tucker Carlson was asking Steve Bannon uh, about the wall crowdfunding project he had. This was to finish building the wall um, oh, yeah. on the southern border. And uh, the, I, the thing I love about this clip is they probably played it in the grand jury that indicted him. Mm. Uh, but here it is. Conferences. We built a wall, a, a two thirds of a mile of wall up a mountain in El Paso within 100 days of starting. I was I was a contractor and ran an advisory board that brought together the best and brightest of all the wall people. So they're not going to criminalize. They're not going to shut me down about talking about the wall. They're not going to criminalize us talking about the wall. Okay. We brought in Kobach and, and Sheriff Clark and all these guys. So that's what the indictment failed to say. But look, all that will come out in court. It, over it, time. it, it will. It will. And I don't is that they're not the key. Yeah. The key thing is they're not going to shut me. They want to criminalize political speech and they're not going to shut me down. And here is the, uh, that's the shot. And here is, of course, the chaser. This happened yesterday in New York City. For every conservative America, this is what happens in the last days of a dying regime. They will never shut me up. They'll have to kill me first. I have not yet begun to fight. Is that Churchill? <laughs> <laughs> is it Churchill? I think it's like Patrick Henry or something like um, that. I wonder if they will forward his Seinfeld residuals uh, to the uh, jailhouse that he's in. I wonder if he gets those. But the guy's being arrested. Let's be clear. He's not being arrested um, for, you know, espousing the need for a wall. He's being arrested for absconding with the money that he raised from people who wanted to build a wall, mm. like his own followers. He was stealing money from, uh, that is the charges. And, uh, apparently they, he was pardoned uh, on a federal level for these. Um, I, I, I mean, does this get through to anybody or is it just like they, they we're going to see like free ban and uh, crowdfunding going now. No, you most certainly are going to see free banning <laughs> paraphernalia. That's why they want people like Herschel Walker and Marjorie Taylor Greene, people who either can't see the gaslighting or will be complicit with the gaslighting. Steve Bannon knows that he's whether he's guilty or not. He knows that this is not an issue of, of the First Amendment. But he also knows that all his audience needs to feel good and to go a little bit further is to feel as though he's a martyr. So that's why he's quoting every line he can remember to make it seem like he's being an honorable hero. And we all know he's an honorable man, don't we? Uh, someone on the IM is saying that uh, Bannon uh, Jackson from Wisconsin says that Bannon was quoting John Paul Jones. But let me ask you this. Don't you think what we're seeing with this with Bannon is the criminalization of crime? in this country <laughs> no you got you have to understand like the the united states honestly this if you real quick this is actually kind of a shadow and a type of what's going on in this country in general steve bannon is saying that no matter what he does that this system is not able to hold him accountable it doesn't matter what law he breaks he has the right to not be held accountable and that's the spoiledness uh, and the the man childishness of 
white supremacy and conservative men in this country right now. There is no lack of, abil of, of, of accountability. That's because do we really expect them to hold each other accountable? Steve Bannon is saying, no, it doesn't matter what he did wrong. You can't hold him accountable. It's fascinating to me to see this full on assault that we're well, fascinating. I don't know if that's the right word, uh, but it, it really is. I mean, if you step back and you see um, the there is this, you know, and, and I think it's basically you know, sort of a libertarian impulse that we're seeing from people who are sort of like the campus uh, ostensibly on the left who are rising up and, and, and talking about the new authoritarianism that's coming from uh, these companies and the FBI and the CIA mm -hmm. and this and that. And, and, and I uh, am extremely skeptical to say the least of the CIA and the FBI, of course. Um, and, uh, you know, of certain policies and programs that the state department and our government has, and uh, obviously the, massive increase in the the military budget and the uh yeah. you know i i do have some issues with the the amount of money that we're pouring into uh a war uh that ostensibly we have no part of um in uh in in ukraine um but with that said there is a it seems to me a difference and this is where, like, even this, like, libertarian strain and ostensibly, you know, sort of like um, uh, maybe some of them dub themselves anti-imperialists as opposed to, like, I mean, their campus. Mm. But you see, you, you mentioned this earlier, where the, the religious fundamentalists are anti-institutional. And That's the institution right. that they're against is the idea of a, of a, of a secular government, of a government. That's right. And and right. and when we see these libertarian attacks on the IRS, on the um, uh, uh, you know, and, and lumping it in with the FBI and the CIA, it sort of gives away the game. Where mm -hmm. it's what this is is there is a, a, an assault on the concept of government, and there this is this is it's no different in terms of its impact than uh, Ronald Reagan getting up there and saying like you know. The, 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 the most dangerous words uh, in the English language are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. That's it, right. it really is no difference. It has the exact same agenda, and it is a libertarian agenda that ultimately is trying to unshackle corporate corporations, really, and, and money. And right. it also behooves, uh, and the payoff for, the, uh, for the, the religious fundamentalists and the theocrats is, we don't have to abide by civil rights laws basically that's right. is, is what it comes down to right. i mean that's the that's where these things sort of meet in the middle and yeah. their their agendas are perfectly um you know sort of like uh, they they just fit together uh very nicely even though they seem to be in disparate camps it's like uh the quote from grover norquist when he's i believe it was norquist when he said um we want to make the government small enough to put it in a bathtub and drown it. Yep. I think neoliberals and institutionalists took that as a metaphor. Obviously, it is a metaphor, but they're very serious about destroying the government by any means necessary because the government itself is an impediment to their power, both economic power and political power. And it seems strange that they would say, OK, well, how do we have politics without a government? easily a theocracy will function just well for capitalism it will function just right for the theocrats and it'll function just fine for institutional republicans who are willing to allow this country to be broken enough for the theocrats to get in power yep i i mean i think this is how this is how you get it i mean you, you, you know, there's been plenty of people who've written in the past that uh fascism in this country is going to come riding on a cross that's right and um and in in many respects, what these the, the the campus and the libertarians do is weaken all they they don't need to assault the institutions in the same way that the the religious fundamentalists do. They they That's assault right. it, um, you know, from uh, you know some type of flanking maneuver essentially. Because all you need is this real sort of like cynicism towards even the concept of of good right. government. 
Right. When, you know, like, uh, the, without a doubt, governments are, are flawed and problematic and this and that. But the, the, the direct assault on these, uh, on the idea of like, of the IRS, for instance, like, yeah, you can have IRS that bad service or they're only auditing, um, you know, they're so stripped of resources that they're, they're finding it easier to audit uh, low income people than um, uh, wealthy people because low income people don't have the lawyers, the army of That's lawyers. Right. That's um, right. but the yeah. answer is fund the IRS so they can go after wealthy people. The answer is get people in the executive branch who mandate that the IRS go after the money as opposed to, um, you know, the sort of like low hanging fruit as it were, um, See, go ahead. I was going to say, this is where institutionalists now become complicit. This is where the Joe Bidens become and the, and the Joe Manchins become complicit because as they see this attack on the institutions that they swore to oath to protect, they feel like it's in, in the margin of error enough for them not to feel like it's a real threat. In other words, you know, if they can't look in the same way, I'm going to hold other Christians accountable with my efforts. If the neoliberals, liberals, Democrats, whoever, however you want to name them, if they are not willing to put white conservative men in check, because that is the very specific power group as defined by Bill O'Reilly from Fox News. He he de he declared America's run by white Christian men. Well, if people, white Christian men like Joe Biden and Joe Manchin don't put their colleagues in check, then the system is going to collapse. Yep. Uh, where can, is there anything that folks who are listening or watching uh, can do to help you in your efforts? No, they absolutely can. They can go to patreon.com. I mean, I hate to make the shameless plug, but patreon.com forward slash the BPD show. Um, and if they want to become a part of the Substack, they can go over there. Uh, I'm writing over at Substack with a lot more details. I talk about that actual process of colonization of Christianity all the way back to Constantine. Uh, if anybody wants a little dense reading. Uh, I'm interested in that. Uh, uh, ben Dixon. The ben, Benjamin Dixon Show. Uh, thanks so much for your time today. We'll put links uh, to all of that in the podcast and YouTube descriptions today. Thanks so much, Sam. It's always a pleasure. All right, man. Appreciate it. You look good, too. I like that. Thanks, suit. man. It's it looks pretty hard good. Time. <laughs> a, little a little inspiring for me to maybe get a little more dressed up. I right, appreciate it again. Um, all right. Uh, we'll be uh, Matthew Film Guy should be here uh, shortly. Uh, what? Do we need to take a quick break? Oh, okay. Okay. Um, let's play this, uh, clip from Ron Johnson. It's apropos. There is, um, right now the reporting is that the Senate is looking to vote on codifying marriage equality in federal law because the Supreme court in overturning the precedent within the steam court, uh, Supreme court, the 50 years that we have had an individual right to get an abortion in this country was overturned just a couple of months ago. I don't know if anybody's heard about this. And I only ask that because it appears that Ron Johnson's not aware of it or just not aware that other people are aware that this has happened in the course of overturning this individual right that existed in this country for 50 years. Clarence Thomas, in his concurring opinion, attacked all of the rights that came out of the uh, substantive due process clause of the 14th Amendment. Now, recall, originally, Alito had put all of this stuff in his draft brief. And then maybe part of uh, the leak, you know, basically had to said to Robert, uh, to Clarence Thomas, like, y maybe you should just walk down this road alone for now, but we'll join you later. Here's Ron Johnson of Wisconsin running behind uh, Mandela Barnes in Wisconsin. Trying to pretend like maybe he doesn't really need to vote for uh, marriage equality because... <laughs> What what could possibly happen at the Supreme Court? Court same-sex marriage bill in its current form says 2015 Supreme Court ruling was wrongly decided. I want my audience, though, to have this context. Uh, Story decisis matters a lot in the United States. 
Stare Decisis protects people of faith. Stare Decisis did not protect Roe and Dobbs for reasons explained by Justice Alito and previously in Citizens United by Chief Justice Roberts. But Obergefell, which uh, made same-sex marriage the law of the land, and Loving from way back, a lot, which made interracial marriage the law of the land, are not in any jeopardy. Stare Decisis protects them. The court in Dobbs said so explicitly that no other decision was called into question. And Pause yet- it for one second. No other um, a decision was called into question in that ruling in the same way that the court said in 2000 when it selected uh, George W. Bush to be president of the United States, this ruling is sui generis. It is not, it is not to be used in any other, it should not contribute whatsoever to uh, the law of the United States. And it has been cited in countless cases over and over and over again in the past 20 years. The having them say, uh, well, we just qualify like it's not uh, uh, we're, we're not looking at the other cases that have been based upon substantive due process in this instance means nothing. Just like when they uh, dealt with Casey and they said, what well, we're in no way. Uh, attacking a woman's right to choose. Just like in other cases over the past couple of years where they have said that. Stare decisis means nothing to this court. And to every... It, 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 and they keep showing it over and over again. But continue. There is an attempt to make Obergefell and Loving appear on sand ground, on, on uh, very, very uh, shaky foundation... Because it serves the political agenda of the Democrats to alarm people. Yeah. It's not true. So what do you say? I would probably vote for this bill that's coming up, but I hate voting for a political bill that's a scare tactic. Well, again, this is another diversionary tactic on the part of the left. They, they simply cannot let any wound remain healed. They've got to pick the scab and they've got to continue to push these wedge issues. Listen, I always supported civil unions. I thought that would have been the reasonable uh, solution for gay marriage, okay, or gay unions. Uh, but the Supreme Court ruled otherwise, you know, ruled, called them gay marriages. And, uh, okay, fine. You know, let's move on. We've got much bigger problems facing this nation. And, you know, because Justice Thomas uh, said that it was wrongly decided, and, I, mean, I, don't, you know, I don't know one way or the other, quite honestly. Um, but it doesn't make any difference. That's my point. It will never be overturned for what you just said there. I mean, stare decisis protects decisions that if were if they were overturned would disrupt people's lives i don't want to disrupt people's lives that's exactly I right want move, i want pretty, to move on pretty good for a non-lawyer move on. pretty good if there are reliance interests in a decision and there are none in roe and casey despite what the left says you cannot disturb that decision there are huge reliance interests in obergefell which is why the lead dissenter in obergefell the chief justice with whom i agreed in his dissent has said, as has all the other concerns, we're not overturning Obergefell. It's done. It's finished. It's over. And so Chuck Schumer wants to bring this up. I would vote for it, Senator, because I want stare decisis to be firmed up everywhere, but I'd add religious liberty protection to make sure everyone understands the ministerial exception and other things are in there. What's going to happen on this? Because clearly the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel and members of the left think you're vulnerable on this issue. Well, that just proves my point. This is simply a political weapon to be used against me. Now, I've, I've already you know, expressed my very reasonable uh, opinion on this. Uh, initially, I said, yeah, I don't see a reason to oppose it. But then, again, I listen to people, and people have expressed some very legitimate concerns about religious liberty. Let's face it, the left, you give them an inch, they want to take 5,000 miles. And you can just imagine how they have pushed this and pushed this and start initiating lawsuits against religious groups and religious, religious institutions and religious individuals. And I think that's the slippery slope we need to protect ourselves against. So I think personally we're probably better off just leaving Oberfeld as it is and not passing anything at this point in time, quite honestly. You know, we'll see what amendments might protect us, but, you know, Hugh, this is a very complex issue. It's very difficult to game this out and figure out all the different permutations based on a law that may or may not protect religious liberty. So, again, I've... I've yeah. Um, 
That's in, incidentally exactly what they said uh, when the the question of o, Obergefell um, showed up at the Supreme Court. Um, no one is forcing anyone to be married to someone of the same sex. Um, no one is forcing any churches to marry um, uh, people of the same sex if they don't want to. It is really more when you engage in commerce, you cannot discriminate against people for people who have a constitutional right at this point, although we know the Supreme Court is capable of taking away constitutional rights, they just did, uh, or a statutory right. If you're going to engage in the secular world, you gotta, uh, you've got to abide by the secular laws. That's it. And it's fascinating to watch the Republicans realize, like, oh, my God, <laughs> we won. And it's wildly unpopular. You caught the, you know, the dog that caught the car. Yeah. And there are, like, it's not just that they caught the car. The car, they're starting to realize, like, it's backing up. It's backing up. Did they argue that stare decisis is the thing that protects us from a Supreme Court doing things that are disruptive? Well, that's the other thing, is that, you know, um, Hugh Hewitt tries to make the argument, there is reliance on this. It would be disruptive. The idea that the 47,000 women who get ectopic, uh, who have ectopic pregnancies every year, uh, the tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of women who, for whatever reason, decide they don't want to carry a, uh, an embryo or a fetus to term, eh, it's not that disruptive. It's not that disruptive. How is it on, day, on one day you have the right to uh, choose whether you will carry a pregnancy to term and all of the ancillary sort of economic uh, self-determination questions and um, just, just all these different life questions that you get to determine for yourself. And then the next day, you have no right to make that decision. How is that not disruptive to people's lives? Or does, does Hugh Hewitt just not really consider... Uh, women as being like people. Yeah. They're not like people. And apparently, according to Ron Johnson, codifying Obergefell, just codifying Obergefell. That's what's going on here. This is just saying, like, just in case the Supreme Court decides to do the same thing they did with uh, abortion rights. This statute will be in place. How is that? Like, what is that a wound? Is it a wound for these people that gay people can get married? Are they, were they wounded by that? It seems like a balm for a wound that's healed. Yeah. Uh, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, Matthew Film Guy will be joining us.
We are uh, back. Sam Cedar on the Majority Report. Uh, joining us is the man who inspired this little ditty. Mission, really. Matthew, film guy, uh, welcome. <clears throat> we really, you know, more than any other guest on this program that has been on, really, I mean, close to the beginning, if not uh, close to the beginning, people have witnessed you uh, really just um, evolve and, and grow. And part of that is, uh, look at you now, we're looking at you, and you look like you're in some type of futuristic uh, viewing room with a massive, I don't know if it's all coming through, if people can see the full frame here, the massive uh, screening OLED. Um, no, that's uh, not. <laughs> what, it's not. What it's is a that? Drape. It's a drape on a window in an Airbnb in Beverly Wood. Okay. So it's not as glamorous as you might want it to oh, be. Oh, dude, why are you ruining my shit? Because I want Why'd to be you honest. Do that? Truth That's a, you're in an first... Airbnb there? Yeah. I just asked you if you were in an edit bay. Yeah, it's it's one, it's an Airbnb that we turned into an edit bay. If you turn to my right, you'll see all the you can see the, you know, this is oh, the who's that? Of of who's that? Is that a mirror? Oh, that's a mirror. That's just you. Uh, all right. Uh, okay. None of this is as impressive as I thought it was. Well, let's just I mean, I'm working on a movie. This is, it's not always glamorous, but it is rewarding. Okay. So where in LA are you? In Hollywood? Have you heard of a neighborhood called Beverly Wood? Because I hadn't until they put us here. But I it's never like, heard of that. It, that sounds like a made up uh, neighborhood. It's just sort of like, uh, like stolen Nolita. Beverly Hills Valor or something. Yes. Apparently, it has been here for quite some time. It probably was a real estate name at the time, but it's between Hollywood and Beverly Hills. So we're sort of a, in a no man's Beverly land. Wood? Where is yeah. that? Like near Doheny? I don't even know where that is. Listen, I have not seen much of LA. Where, where, like, are you room. on Santa Monica or Sunset? South Beverly. Yeah. I got news so. for you. That's made up. <laughs> yeah, that's but just, it was like made yeah. up in the '40s. I looked into that, but anyway, uh, that's regardless. just the way. It, yeah, it was. Uh, uh, yeah, they brought it back for Airbnb rates. That's it. Don't no, kid there's yourself. signs everywhere. Listen, this is. I'm not the real estate guy. I'm the film guy, so I just go where they okay. the production said. They they originally wanted to put us at Venice Beach, but it was like in a small place with one bedroom, and it wasn't going to work for the edit room, so we needed a two bedroom. And oh, this is just dude, what came up. You should have done the Venice Beach thing. That's much. Better. I know, I know. Everybody's telling me that, but it was oh. it was not. The facilities were not good. There was no air conditioning in these places. So what do you need air conditioning for? It's only 115 degrees. Yeah, out there. exactly. The computers were great in an oven, and How? we actually even had a brownout here the other day where I couldn't work because. Uh, it was getting like low voltage to everything. Okay. So. so wait a second. What movie are you working on? Then we can like sort of unravel all this other stuff. Yeah. Like the my, uh, is my sister's out in LA. She says it's exhausting. Like it, with that type of heat, it just becomes super oppressive. Yeah. Well, listen, I'm literally spending 12 hours a day, morning till night working on this movie to try to get it ready for the Sundance deadline. It's a, it's a, um, you know, a independent feature film, um, you know, under $5 million. But it is the uh, feature film. What is it film. over? They don't tell you that. They just want well, to. Well, I you. did a couple of under five million dollar films too myself. <laughs> exactly. I don't uh, actually know the full budget, but let's just say I'm not getting rich off of doing it. I'm doing it because I love the script and I believe in the vision of its director, who is an actress who's been in a number of movies, uh, none of which I had actually seen. But uh, I've come to really. Who are uh, these people, or is this all top secret? No, I'm I'm just giving a preamble. If you okay. give me five more seconds, I'll get there. Uh, the director is um, an actress and now a writer and director named Brittany Snow. Do you know who she is, Sam? Brittany Snow. If I'm not mistaken, that means she was born of uh, a uh, a father and uh, who. You're saying she's a bastard. Has... I believe her father's name is actually John Snow. If I Matthew. Yes. Ma Matthew, she was in John Tucker Must Die, correct? 
correct. Her big claim to fame were the Pitch Perfect films, which I understand are quite enjoyable. Oh, Mila was a huge fan of that. I don't know if you remember when she uh, interviewed um, uh, David Cross in these studios about oh, yes. Um, yes. about uh, uh, about that uh, that 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 movie. But it's just she was in um, okay, Pitch Perfect. Okay, I don't recognize yeah, um, her. I'm seeing pictures of her. I don't recognize her. She she actually was an actress ever since she was a kid. She was started out in soap operas, and so she's been a working actress since she was a pre-adolescent. Mm-hmm. Um, and now mm-hmm. she's making her feature film, writing and directing debut. It's a very personal story. It's the kind of movie that I love to see and love to be a part of, uh, uh, risking something, uh, exposing something dangerous or perhaps uh, embarrassing in your life. And... Um, can you it's, tell us a little uh, bit a, woman, a little bit about what it's about? Yeah, briefly, it's about a woman struggling with the fallout around all of her relationships uh, after she's struggled with a, an eating disorder. She goes to rehab, and it's kind of you know light touch around it. It's we're not making it an issue movie, but it's definitely this is the um, the story that is driving the action. Um, and it stars an amazing actress named Courtney Eaton, who people may have seen in things like um, Mad Max Fury Road. Uh, she's a young actress. Um, you know, she was probably born sometime right around you were shooting Who's the Caboose. So that tells you what the what the timeline is for understanding who yep. she is. Yeah, okay. And she was gotcha. in she is in the show Yellow Jackets too. She's uh, Yellow good. Jackets, yes, yeah. that's also she's a big very, hit very right good. now. Uh, I hadn't seen it, but uh, yes, that's something big. For if her. I'm not mistaken, if I remember correctly, she's uh, she's Australian, right? Uh, that's she was that's Australian, right, Sam. Uh, I, wow, your Google is working on overtime <laughs> right now. I just remember her as a sporting role as Ava in the 2019 film Line well, of I, Duty. Oh, wow, you remember even the character's name? That's it's weird. It's yeah. so eidetic memory. Yeah. If uh, I'm not mistaken, Bunbury, I believe. Bunbury, Australia is where she's from. Oh, is that it's her neighborhood? Okay. <laughs> yep. Uh, but the rest of the cast is equally as amazing. Thomas Mann is the sort of the male lead. Uh, the rapper Kid Cudi is, has got a small part in it. Um, Gina Rodriguez, Joel McHale. Also, actually, one of my favorite scenes I've edited so far is with Dave Bautista. You'll know him from the Marvel movies, Sam, as the uh, Drax, the Destroyer. You know, he's the he's the comedic relief. Painted Guardians green. of the Galaxy. No, okay, maybe, maybe you saw it. I know you saw. I, it. I mean, I, saw, saw it. I definitely saw it, but I don't. Uh... Yeah, if I was doing this interview with Saul in my life, I'd be killing right now. But uh, anyway, if I think of Bunbury, if I'm not That's mistaken, right. is near Perth. Uh, which would be on the western part of Australia. But uh, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, remember that time you went to Australia and you yep. worked and you ran around and you want to yep. tell us that story? Didn't go to Perth. No. But go ahead. Okay. All right. Because <laughs> if I had a story about Perth, I would tell you. But I didn't. I didn't right. I'm it sure. Far. I'm sure you would. Any, anyway, it's been really great. We're still assembling it and uh, doing the sort of first edit, but it's been really, really great. And uh, yeah, what were can you I say? on set while they were shooting? Where'd they shoot in L.A.? No, they actually shot in New York, and the, and the odd story here, which is one for the panel, too, I guess, is that they hired me without realizing I, I lived in New York. So they hired me. They said, we want you. We like your work. You're, you got the job. Uh, and then they're like, oh, shit, he lives in New York. So then they had to scramble and get me set up out here, and so I've been here for the past, I don't know, month or so. And you've got to be out there because she, the director is out there, and they want uh, close proximity as they – uh, because yeah. so, and she'll stop by, uh, well, you know, uh, uh, Beverly Wood and, um, and, and check out what you're, what you're working on. Yeah. So she'll you plug wanna... it into the GPS. Where the hell is that? And then, yeah, she gets herself there. And, and, and you weren't on set when they were doing this. So, no. and did you log it all or do they log it? Do they now log it for you when you come in as an editor? Ah, uh, Sam, you know just the questions to ask me on the my new level. Actually, I'm, this is still an independent feature, so there, I don't really have an assistant. The DIT on the set, the guy who sort of takes in the footage, he actually did more than on the last movie I did where he had sunk it and put it into folders and stuff. So some of that had been done, but I, I still had a, a lot of work to do for the first like two weeks making proxies and doing all that kind of stuff. So I'm sort of my own assistant and my own apprentice even. I, I actually had dinner with my friend Jeff who edits bigger movies like he did. He did War Dogs, the movie that uh, What's-His-Name wrote the book Gee, for. And, right, Gee, And the yeah, Joker awesome. and stuff like that. And I'm listening to what he gets. And by the time he sees it, it's all laid out. It's all organized. It's all put into bins. And even the lines are like, you know, you put a mark on each line so you can say, which is every take where she says this line? So I have to do all that. 
basically by hand, which is, you know, a good way of getting how much footage? footage. You know, people ask that, but it, it would take me wasted time to put it end to end to end to end. It's, you know, hundreds of hours because, you know, it's digital video. So okay. many of the takes just roll and roll. Yeah. So you cut between them and stuff. So that's one of the first things I do is just cut out all the rolls in between the resets, you know, and make it new takes and stuff like that. So. Have you ever sat down with any uh, old timey editors and t talked about the difference in yield? Oh, I don't have to. I mean, I know for a fact it's like the shooting ratios, you know, explode uh, when digital video comes out. Without a doubt. But I mean, yeah. what does that do? What? How does that change the the job of an editor? I mean, on the one hand, you have more creative choices. So you can kind of be more of the creative voice a little bit right when you have well we did it from 40 different angles and by the fifth take they were sort of doing it differently than the first take so i think maybe it could go this way so it i think it opens up more creative choices for the editor that's the plus side yeah you know the downside creative is choices obvious. also in terms of like even like story and tone in a way that right. maybe didn't exist before yeah like if she says the same line angrily let's say broadly instead of sad it and you build an arc where the scene goes one way instead of another the same lines with the same blocking could make a different meaning to the scene and therefore the movie in a some small way. So yeah, that is part of the the fun of having a, a more takes and so on. But then again, many actors who are really professional, they will nail it the same way basically every time too. So that's not always the case. That's like the way you know, I and then the go. downside is just that there's way more footage to go through. Right. They, you know, I have her her like circle takes, uh, which we have our own system. We're calling it butterflies. Um, but why? The, that's just that's just her. I think adorable affectation that she decided that that was going to be the way we called them. Do you have um, to say adorable affectation as opposed to like idiosyncratic weirdness uh, as a way of like maintaining your good graces? If I if I meant idiosyncratic weirdness, I would have said idiosyncratic weirdness. But okay. I think it's cute. Are you um, afraid that there's a camera in the room? Is this being recorded? Oh well, I guess there's this is a camera as well. Okay, so yeah. All right. No, no, no. no. Yeah, I, it's nice. She a big and, fan uh, of and your when appearances I have a good one, on, I say it's a on Fridays. Bee, so what's that? She a big fan of your appearance on the show on Fridays. I am not sure she's familiar, although yeah, I will right. certainly let her know. All right. um, she was a fan of my work on Black Bear. That was basically the the thing that got me on her radar. That's a, it was, um, it was a but good I'm move. sure this was like one A right there with with right. That. I mean, both those things. It's good to know. But, that you, you have know, some I, I I have her selects, but I'm the kind of meticulous editor where I want to see even the takes that weren't necessarily circled. Maybe there's one or two lines in those that actually are maybe good and better than what was in the overall good take. Do you review all the footage at one time, or do you review all the footage for each scene that you're working on so that it's fresh in your head? Uh, good question, but it's a little bit of a third option. I My first pass at everything is just what I call like my selects and notes take. So I go from scene one to scene 120, making notes with the marker tool, pulling How out long the moments that, that I think you? are good in bed. Weeks, weeks. It's really a first pass. It's like a first pass without an edit, you know? So okay. you sort of have a paper edit in a way, but, you know, a few options. So I go from the beginning to the end. But what I like to do is, not edit the movie edit the scene right after i do that so it's not it's not that it's fresh and i get a new perspective so I, it's like i see it again with a almost an open mind based on my notes so i pull them in and i kind of build it from there so i go all the way to the end and i've almost done that although in this film with with britney here we've started building scenes a little bit earlier in the process because she's eager to just get started and it's helping me get film uh, scenes closer to the director's cut version before like in some films i'll do an entire editor's cut then the director will come in and say no yes this that uh with her we're actually building some scenes more from the ground up which has been kind of cool actually all right uh that sounds like fun so uh how yeah. many how many more weeks do you got on this bad boy uh that's an open-ended question actually um so we're just trying to make a sundance deadline which is october so that's basically our hardest deadline right now and we want to try to get enough of a cut to sort of show to some people first and get some feedback before that so time's a time's a ticking Time's a ticking. I, I'm not going to assume that you mean like you need to speed this up at all. Uh, you are three. No, I certainly am happy to take an hour or two hours out of my day to do this with you. Well, let me ask you this. Um, you're very busy. Uh, you've gone out to L.A. You're working on this. But yeah, I've, I've seen a key few people. 
but yet you had time to go and do some other podcast uh, that is not this one. No. Um, do you want to cop to that? Do you want to oh, talk absolutely, about absolutely. it? Absolutely. This is the cop is the wrong word. Uh, I'll share my pleasant experience I had reconnecting with our old pal Mark Marin. Went out Cop. to his house and don't recognize that name. He was a comedian. He still is a comedian, but you oh. knew him. You you were his intern. You don't remember that? I was. <laughs> there was a time actually I did feel like his intern, where I would uh, meet him at a coffee shop and just see like what. Um, I thought uh, that was your formulation, not mine. But okay, yeah, whatever. It, it, however it, it, you want to color that. I followed him around uh, San yeah. Francisco for about six months. Uh, um, 90, 92, I think it was. He certainly remembers who you are. I'll just put it to you that way. All right. Uh, that's good to hear. That's good to hear. We've been. Um, and so I went over there just to, just to say hi. You know, I'm trying to see the two or three people that uh, I, I know out here on the one or two days a week I have off. And, and then when I came in, he's like, oh, Brendan says, should we do a bonus episode? I said, OK, fine. Uh, you know, the return of the little, see, uh, little sort of series we used to do back in the days before he figured out how to make WTF successful. He used to have me on. And right. we would do like a few early, with early. Matthew. The first couple, yeah. Yeah, like within the first ten episodes, I did like three or four, I think. Yeah. And he so was it really... was, the, it was, but it was for members only. So you got to be a, a full Marin member to get access because I'm I worth see. it. Five I bucks. See. And uh, yeah, we had a nice chat. It was very cool. We had a lot of fun. We talked about old times. We talked about the whole break room live thing. We talked about all our, you know, what Marin does with his guests. What happened with us? What was the thing? You know, there was always, you know some question of uh does he, friendship did, was he like um like vaguely dismissive of you uh of the work you're doing now was that was that did that come up did like uh, you know what in, in i guess i wouldn't i didn't think of it that way at the time i don't think he's vaguely dismissive but he kept saying like oh you're just editing movies you're not directing them you should be directing movies you is that directing. what he said yeah but i yeah. i really you know I you realize if you were if you were directing and editing movies, he would be like, you're not producing them? Yeah. That's weird. No, you I think, really think he about wants acting, the best for me. That's how, I, that's how I take it. You gotta, I, gotta yeah, that's dirty. interesting that you would take that. from. Uh, maybe it's been a long time since you've been in touch with him. Maybe that's part of the reason. <laughs> I why also have grown as a human being, you know, so I like to give everybody the benefit of the doubt. But it, I mean, it's interesting to get uh, to grow and become less insightful. That sometimes is the survival mechanism, okay? I appreciate that. No, of course. Um, well, and so uh, so it was nice. You you and Marin had fun time. Did he did he take yeah. you out uh, to lunch at all? Or did, like, because uh, I've been out uh, with him, and he, he usually like Dutch is about as good as it gets with him. No, not not this time. This was just a brief. I only had a few hours to hang out too. You know, I got to be back and doing this work, so it wasn't like that. But I think I'm going to see him again maybe tomorrow. We might do something well, else. So yeah. Does he it need to move, move something out of the garage or what? It would like it's a, it's yeah, it's weird. He needs he's moving all this. You no, know, he has all these cases of liquid death. It's like water that sponsors him. So maybe that's what it is. I don't know. He has a a, a water that sponsors him. Li yeah. it's called liquid death. It's like a, yeah, it's like a metalish. It. It's like a metal like can of water. And by metal, I mean it like has like crazy font, like liquid death, like like Matthew's interest. Kill, kill your thirst. And does he does he actually drink it? Yeah. Did, like, I can share a picture of a of us at the. Uh, I was going to share the picture. I hadn't have time yet, but you can see it on his desk. But anyway, maybe that is what it is. If you want to make it something, you know, dark, maybe that is what it is that we're going to do next. But I don't think so. I think we're going to hang out and do something fun. Okay. Well, I'm glad to and hear we'll that. We'll probably talk about you some more, Sam. Don't worry. All right. Well, uh, that would be nice. <laughs> it's the least you could do with you. You know. I guess sort of like a lot of times what we ask of our guests is please don't do any other shows within two or three weeks of your appearance on the majority report. Cause we don't want to hurt our numbers, but I don't whatever. think, I think there's a lot of crossover and I'll be honest. I thought you were asking me on today be just deliberately because of that, but obviously your staff hadn't informed you of the uh, recent. I was not told that you had done that. I saw yeah. something posted somewhere and i'm like was this like throwback thursday or something like that i didn't realize that you were it was an old LA. picture that they posted yeah so that maybe yeah, yeah i didn't it didn't it didn't completely um uh track with me but all right well that's great no i'm very very happy for you matthew 
Did that sound like Mike? Uh, that did it sound like Mark? Yeah. I listen. Like listen. All I can say is I I defended you. Okay, so you don't have. Well, to- that's fine. I mean, you know, the thing with Mark is that like it's not it's not um, it is, the, and this is what I appreciate. It, it doesn't matter to Mark how successful he is. Um, that does not resonate with him unless other people are completely static in their uh, endeavors in terms of like, so Mark has progressed in his career and it, that in and of itself doesn't matter to him. What matters is the dynamic between him and others around them. So um, he still has it within him to resent your success, even though he's been successful. That's the thing. It, you know, like he doesn't like any change in some type of dynamic in the way that he perceives like relative success. I see. I see. So he and I get along because like I've been doing this show basically. I'm exactly where I was like 10 years ago in terms of the way he perceives career. But his career has skyrocketed. So he perceives the the, the like this this dynamic. And that, it, you know, that's why we still get along. But you look at you. You're in like what looks like a very fancy screening room, at least. This is, you know, a, screen, this is a movie screen. It looks like a massive movie screen in the yeah. way that you set that up. And so I could just see how he might be a little resentful. But let's not talk. Let's no, not I, get... think he's, I think he's happy for me, too. I think he just wants me to achieve my fullest, best self. And he knows that I have skills as a director, and he's trying to push for it. Okay. Well, I see. All right. So I don't want to uh, keep you away from editing your little film. Uh, but uh, <laughs> what <laughs> what do you have uh, to recommend for us? Um, well, uh, as part as part of my uh, sort of getting up to speed with what Britney's sort of aesthetic is and what she's sort of trying to get at, she's given me, you know, as directors do, a kind of list of movies that are touchstones or inspirations, maybe not content wise, but maybe stylistically, maybe a little bit of both. Um, and two of them that I watched were they were already on my two C list, but you know they get bumped up to the top when you're in a situation like this. And I cannot recommend them any more highly. Whoa. And they're fairly recent. Um, Whoa. And they're not exactly obscure, but they're still like low budget enough that it'd be great to boost their signal. One is a movie uh, let me called guess. The War- Thor. Well, yeah. The the latest Thor movie. Th- the new Thor movie. Yes, yeah. exactly. Saul said it's one of the best movies ever. <laughs> Whoa, what? Yep. I didn't see better it. Than, but he better said than Ace Ventura? He said it's one of the best movies ever. Wow. He's seen a lot of movies. He has. He's seen all the Marvels. Yep. Well, I will see that eventually, but I have he not seen it. said it was it. funny. Well, I don't know. Sweet. Show him this movie. Show him right, this next movie. What I'm about. To, what I'm about to recommend. Show him this movie, and then see how he compares them. Okay. Uh, uh, okay. So the film I was gonna say is the worst person in the world by Joachim Trier. I saw that. You saw it. Yeah. Oh, well, play the music because this is a. This is a yeah. First. I saw that. The 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 um. It, it was the Norwegian was it a friend, movie. Right? It was a Norwegian. Yeah. Um. Yeah. This woman who uh she was uh, involved in a relationship and uh it, you know that that whole thing. Yeah. No, I enjoyed yeah. that movie. Yep. Now, what brought you to see that? I'm just curious. It's a wonderful thing because you, you know co- maybe much. it was COVID. COVID. Yeah. Yeah. Like I needed a break from from watching uh, Mad Men because I was getting so depressed uh, by Mad Men. Like uh, that Mad Men, when you watch that back to back, that is a brutal show. Much more like w- you watch it once every week and it's like, OK, you have time to digest it. But back to back, that thing is brutal. Um, and yeah, and did, worst, worst did worst person in the world cheer you up? It's not exactly a. a- no. Nope. Cohesively happy story, but it is it is quite I think uh, inspirational in its sort of picture of life. It's just, but it's dealing with some hard truths. Yep. Yep. Okay. But it's well, definitely well, so really. You, you, you talk about it because I can't uh, talk about it. Well, I don't even. No, know I'll just. I won't say too much about it. I'll just say that it's got a voice of its own. Uh, apparently, it is the third in a sort of loose trilogy based around Oslo that Joachim Trier made, but I haven't seen the other two. But it's. You know, I think it's the greatest thing about it is that it's willing to show a protagonist 
who is not exactly this idealized person. She makes some sort of selfish decisions. She makes some sort of ones that you wouldn't like say root for her to make, let's say, but without it condemning her, right? It sort of has a non-judgmental sort of a, a loving touch towards all of it. And I just really appreciate when a movie can do that without needing to sort of moralize and yet, or even aggrandize certain behaviors. Um, and it's got a little bit of a surrealistic sort of touch here and there, but it's mostly a very down to earth kind of human emotions driven drama. And uh, what a wonderful thing in this day and age to be able to say that a new great movie such as that has been made. So uh, A plus on that one. It was, it was like, I, I, what I liked about it, it was not predictable. Right. I mean, it wasn't exactly, you know, it's not a, it's not a, a thriller in any way. I don't want to give people the, the run, but, but it was, it's just like for a movie like this, it was not predictable at all. Yeah. Um, you think you're getting ahead of it. You think like, oh, this is what's going to happen and she's going to go and do this. And then it's like, what, huh? Ooh. Right. And yet it, it didn't, and it didn't feel um like, just like. It, it didn't feel contrived. Right. right. It didn't feel, uh, it, it felt there was an internal logic to it that you sort of recognize as it's happening, but it was still sort of like, on some level, it's one of those movies that plays with our expectations of movies. Yes. Yes. Very well said, Sam. And Thank you know you. what? As a, yeah, you, I mean, look, you're not, you're not, not a film guy, or at least you were. You know what um, else did that was Sixth Sense, The Sixth Sense, but it, that's oh, a yeah. completely different yeah. movie. But yeah, but it, yeah. but it's same same type of thing. Sixth yeah. Sense was all just playing against our, uh, you know that that movie, them is the ancient movie. Uh, but yeah, that, but that also know, had like a surprise, ha ha, you know. Well, it did, but that the the reason why it was really a surprise is because it manipulated um, sort of structures of of filmmaking to right. really fake you out. Yeah. This, in some ways, didn't manipulate the structure of filmmaking, but it 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 played with your expectations of how a protagonist is supposed to be in, in, in a movie. Yeah, I listen. I will give this movie a little bit more credit because it's in some ways it's easier to mess with the expectations of a sort of you know without a doubt. I agree yeah. totally. You know what I, I mean? Agree. Yes. And this is more just like what it's just about people and love and relationships and is she going to be with the guy? Also, yeah. I'll just say as a side note, totally on a personal level, the whole discussion with the one boyfriend about like getting older and like what your career is worth versus your just your life and all that stuff and. Oh, that just like definitely hit home for me. Uh, yep. the, the one boyfriend who's a little bit older than her, his whole speech, that was very just on a content level. Uh, I resonated with that. Um, but all right, let me tell you the next one here. Um, it's sort of uh, sort of the, the opposite end of the lens in some ways, and that is Bo Burnham's movie, The Eighth Grade. Have you, have you seen that one? Oh, it's so good, yeah. Wait, The Eighth Grade about the, the girl in yeah. eighth grade? Yeah. Yeah, of course I watched that because my kid was in eighth grade when that happened. <laughs> Great. Two for two. See, That's I'm, very impressive. I'm behind the curve on these. What's yeah. that, Bradley? I, two for two. I'm very impressed. I don't think I don't yeah. think Sam has gotten two. I for don't two think. Before. And, and those no. are the only two movies I've seen. Yeah, and in, and they were two that I hadn't seen but had meant to, and these were ones that were high on the list for Brittany to show me. So uh, I'm glad we're all in the same. Eighth picture. grade watching that movie was painful because my daughter. Oh. It, it, it was so true to the experience of of. Uh, you know, uh, of of my daughter in eighth grade. Yes. Brutal. Brutal. I mean, I, it's been many years since I've been in eighth grade and it was brutal for me to watch too. I mean, I just am in awe of this actress that she was able to embody this energy and this performance in a completely unselfconscious way. And that the movie around her was stylish enough, but didn't try to like tart it up. If you know what I'm saying, yeah. didn't try to like, editorialize or and it also avoided a lot of the cliches that you might have i mean we've seen like welcome to the dollhouse and some of these other movies that are maybe even a little harsher let's say a little more misanthropic yep. this managed to stay true yep. but also not brutal i mean there's that of course everyone remembers that one scene in the back seat uh with the guy that, I that takes her oh, home that was just terrible. like i don't remember that oh, oh it's we like, must have blocked it out because that well, was it's like been years and i i probably blocked out like 98 of that movie based upon he gives an older kid gives her a ride ho home and then he tries to like make a pass at her and she rejects him and he kind of is like like you're not gonna even like know what you're doing like you're gonna you're gonna like suffer in high school basically the pool scene is also mortifying as well oh. the pool party 
that, but, was, um, that was that was rough. But at least the, the sort of the nerdy cousin guy uh, offers some relief there. That 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 backseat scene really like I really asked myself. I remember thinking, is this movie gonna really take a turn here? And it sort of like just touched the sort of atmosphere of darkness and then skipped off. So I yep. was just uh, which so is in awe of it. which is like. Um, I mean, a fairly sort of like that was the part, you know, because eighth grade does end <laughs> like, like you do, like you, you go into yeah. ninth grade and 10th grade and this stuff like impacts you and exists and it's real, but it also sort of like, um, I mean, that's the, that's the, the whole thing about like, you realize as a parent, like with child is like the kids are going through real things. But they also, and they 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 do not perceive it having the ability to resolve or change or anything because time is so different when you're that young uh, that there's no perspective. Like I could go through like you know a year or two or three years and go, oh, these are rough two or three years, and but I know it's gonna pass. <laughs> like, but but for you know it's a kid, yeah. it's like that's one quarter of my life <laughs> you know like and, and yeah, there's, feels... there's no indication this will ever change yep yep and but just uh, same did you also not in some way identify with her dad because that character was so hilarious to me yeah like, he was awesome trying, he was so funny trying so hard to connect and failing so yes. miserably yes in all new and creative ways yeah i just thought that was another character that could have been a cartoon but wound up being really, really well shaded and just, uh, you know, his humanity was never sacrificed for comedy or anything. He just wasn't, you know, the, the, the frequencies weren't lining up. It was yep. really amazing. Yep. Both films, uh, very naturalistic, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, I'd say worst person in the world. There's that whole scene where like time stops and he mm. plays with like the film a little bit more. But also at the same time, eighth grade has a kind of a stylish direction to it, which again, if you know Bo Burnham, he was, he was an internet comedian, a musician, and there was no indication that he was going to be this great cinematic artist, but he has such a command of the craft here where it didn't have a kind of a showiness to it, but actually the direction in the, in the mise-en-scene, if you will, Sam, really helped tell the story in a way that put it beyond the, just the banal kind of, you know, just kiddie teen story. And so, Vol I, you know, they're realistic, but they also had a style to them that I felt was a unique voice. Um, Sam, Vulture, you know, has, Vulture has a list of A20, like best A24 films, best films from the studio, and, and Eighth Grade was obviously on there. And something that the writer mentioned that was, I thought I agreed with is the way that the way that Burnham portrays like social media for how kids are on it now, just like the endless stream of content and th and like, you know, commentary from friends and like things that they're seeing and internalizing so strongly, like. I thought was is is super like um one of the best I think exam uh, you know exemplifiers of social media usage for kids in movies I'd say and I'll actually mention Bradley not to do too much of a spoiler alert but this movie that we're working on Britney's movie social media definitely plays a large role in the impact that it has on the way women see their bodies and are being asked to for expect sure. and compare themselves so this was a part of the reason I was asked to see that movie is the wonderful way that it handles social media because it's. It's not going away, and it affects all all people. I mean, it even affects me. I mean, you know, I'm I'm feeling the urge to look at Instagram right now rather than do this, but I, I'm managing. I appreciate your, your your the self control that you're exercising. That's I appreciate that quite a bit. I actually do think that um, I I I I hope that society evolves to the point where they can understand that, like you know, Instagram. Uh, Facebook, uh, some of these social media platforms can be just as detrimental in some ways to the well-being of, you know, kids under the age of, let's say, 14 um, as drinking smoking. And, yeah. and smoking uh, cigarettes or jewels or, or pot for that matter. Yeah. Like, yeah. and I, I, I would imagine we're going to get there at one point because, you know, Particularly eighth grade. I mean, the thing is, is, like, that was contemporaneous. That generation, that age cohort, that specific age cohort, and I'm talking a very narrow one, came of age where they were, like, 10 when there was over 50% adoption of smartphones. 
Yeah, and I believe there's a conversation in that movie where he, the kids, the the teenage seniors, say to the eighth graders, "Like you're you're from another generation. Like when did you have Instagram?" And she was like fifth grade or something. And they're like, "Whoa!" Yep. yep. Even they knew it. Yep. And um, and that was when it was first introduced, and we just didn't have an idea. I think like as parents, like this is you know kid number two for me. He's not getting a smartphone for, uh, you know, for quite a while. And, uh, and Mila got one at this age, I think pretty close. Uh, cause she was walking to school and it, flip phone. That's, uh, that's the new solution. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, if I could, if I could outlaw it until, uh, age 14, I would do it because you don't need to go through, uh, those years where the idea of commodifying yourself is a, um, is a concern. In my mind, no, we, we know alcohol can warp your brain permanently at that age. Uh, I think we need to start to see that the social media thing can do just the same. Without a doubt. Place. Without a doubt. There was, you know, back uh, five or six years ago, maybe a little longer, there was um, a, a couple of people writing about about how uh, things like Instagram and, and Facebook and, uh, I, you know, it could apply to TikTok is really about you know, you're training people to enter into a sort of a neoliberal marketplace where they're commodifying themselves. And, uh, mm -hmm. instead of you cash, are the product. instead of cash, you get chits, you know, in the form of likes and dislikes and, um, thumbs up and that type of thing. But so, uh, the worst person in the world and the eighth grade, those are two, uh, movies. This is the first time it's ever happened that, uh, I have seen both the movies Where's and the I saw them before you. Yeah. Da -da 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 -da. Charge. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate that very much. I uh, thank you. Thank you. Cherish thank you. it. Oh. Cherish it. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Okay. Um, well, uh, Matthew, this has been great catching up with you. Uh, your your Airbnb looks wonderful. Uh, it looks it's a screening like room. Screening room. I mean, it really does look like you're in a completely like. I mean, they could put I a picture up. Right? No, they could I'm put honest. a picture. They could have put a picture up. It just looks so sparse in there that it does look like a, like an institution you're in. Yeah, they let me you out of the jacket me, just right? to do this. You'd tell me. Okay, uh, Matthew, film guy. Where can people get more information? They want to go to your uh, box your box thing follow me on twitter at langdon boom and also you can start i think the link to sign up for my new uh film appreciation class online oh is, is that still start, happening that's is gonna it based happen. out of the why it, it's the queen's common point community center yes that is the one and okay, uh they, they've undergone some name changes over the years that's but right. it's the same place but uh we still have a great group of people who get together and talk about films once a week on tuesdays and I don't really teach the class. I more like lead the conversation and I bring the films that are different and weird and ones I haven't seen that we can talk over. It's going to be a little delayed while I do this movie, but I think it's going to start up end of October again. So be on the lookout for that if I don't see you guys again before then. And yes, you can follow me on Letterboxd, uh, also at Langdon Boom or Matthew Film Guy. You can do a search and follow along with all the great movies that I look at and sometimes review and whatnot. Thanks. Oh, Matthew, can I ask you one last film opinion? Have you seen the new Orphan movie, Orphan First Kill? No. I, you know what? I should bring Mary in here. I think, I think she was dying to see that the other night. Um, she's a big fan of the Orphan films, I think. But uh, I have to admit, I have not delved. Okay, is it, maybe I couldn't is, watch the it, what, What's your thoughts on that? The plot is very funny to me. Um, it wasn't sort of what I was expecting. I was I have, I haven't seen the first one, so I was expecting like a horror type movie. But instead, it's sort of like a catch me if you can sort of thing with a really um, a funny like satirical plot. I think. Yeah, watch the first one, Matt. I'd be interested to see what you think of it. Okay, I I know that Mary is on though, so uh, I I delve occasionally into the horror thing. So uh, I will. Thank you guys. All right. Say hi to Mary. Uh, goodbye, Matthew. Thank you. Uh, if you say hi to, uh, if you see your uh, buddy, um, uh, Marin, Mark. Yep, yeah, Mark yep. Marin, uh, tell him I say hello as well. I definitely will. Sam, Great. thanks Great. everybody. All right. Matthew film guy, ladies and gentlemen. See you next time. Um, are we going to do another freebie Friday? We did the one two last in a row. week too. Jesus. Hi. Freebie fall. Yeah, give me a break. Uh, it's like, uh, 
just like just give 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 it's all we do around here uh folks just a reminder even though it's going to be a freebie friday um it's your support that makes the show possible you can become a member by going to join the majority report join the majority report.com and uh when you sign up for the show you not only get the free half free of commercials you also get the fun half although you're getting that today Keep the commercials in for the special uh, Sabbath uh, break. Uh, we'll keep that in for everybody today, including members, uh, because sometimes you get a break on that. You want that. But if you want to help this show survive and thrive, become a member today. Join the majority report.com. Also, folks, first game of the season last night in the, um, the, the football sport that exists. And um, did, did, did Emma make a prediction on that game? Uh, this was not one of our top three bets, but uh, so Sunday will be more of our uh, big um, showdown. Okay. But so you're gonna want to check it out. Yeah. Uh, the whole season we previewed. So you can you can you can find the full show. Go to the Majority Report uh, YouTube. Uh, search for E S V N, the Emma Sports Vigland Network. <laughs> And, uh, but you can also find, uh, some clips on, uh, the ESVN, uh, YouTube page. What's the, uh, it's just, yeah, it's the, it's youtube.com slash ESVN. It's in, ESVN. The, it's in the show description. And Nobody had taken ESVN yet. No, I guess oh, that's, pretty... and, and we're now at, we are now on Spotify also. So, okay. And so, yeah, you can find, uh, the, um, the podcast as well is available. So check that out, folks. Matt, what's happening in the Matt Leckian media universe? Uh, yeah, Left Reckoning, we've got a think tank uh, releasing for patrons. So get your, uh, if you're a, our patron at patreon.com slash Left Reckoning, you got a little bit uh, before you get, uh, if you want to submit a question. Also, my conversation with Joshua Khan Russell about ayahuasca is uh, going to be released for everybody tomorrow. I want to hear that. Uh, did it involve vomiting? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, all right, let's get into uh, let's get into this. Um, Greg Gutfeld. I mean, this is you know we've been talking about this theme where the Republicans have nothing to run on, and um, they really don't. That that is you know, and it's been clear for a while. But the absence of Trump on the ballot makes it that much clearer, right? Because off-year elections are really about the parties and everybody knows the that generally the party in power loses big time on off year elections because the the party out of power runs against them and says they haven't done x y or z that's not happening this cycle there's attempts again to say that uh, you know Biden is uh, both Hitler and inept, right? And which you know they sort of they cut against each other. You can't you can't say the guy is the greatest threat to uh, everybody. And he doesn't know where he is. And he also can't um, you know literally find his way you know from the bathroom to the bedroom because he gets lost. Um, that cuts against it, and. Really, it has to be just sort of generic culture war stuff. And who better but the devout whatever Greg Gutfeld is. Um, uh, here is Greg Gutfeld uh, basically categorizing, and it really is, I think, unhelpful from a uh, Republican perspective, although I don't know that he gets this, because they have reached peak... Um, old people resent. And that's what this is really about feeding into. Or maybe it's just he's doing it for his TV ratings. Take a page out of Joe's handbook of fear, right? Scare the crap out of parents with facts. Make it palpable. Meanwhile, when you look at, I, you know, when you, this is going to be a very, I'm, I'm going to act like uh, Jesse and make a bro uh, broad statement. <laughs> I remember when I was watching the protests after 2016 <laughs> when Trump won and I saw the protests it was a lot of single women. It wasn't a lot of men. And the men there, they weren't exquisite specimens. Let's be, let's face <laughs> Pause it. Pause it for one second. He's talking about the, like the million woman march. Now, I don't know how he assumes that they were uh, single, but I would imagine 
there will be both uh, single and partnered and married women at the Million Women March. Uh, the actual breakdown, I can't imagine anybody knows. Um, it's funny to hear Greg Gutfeld talk about specimens Exquisite of men. specimens? Uh, I, hmm. I don't know what, what he's... Uh, <laughs> What what I what mean, yeah, like what's what what his um, not exactly LeBron James. No, I mean th this guy is not. Um, let's put it this way: if we had to send a male up uh, into space to uh, you know for aliens, Greg Gutfeld would be sort of low on the list if you wanted to send the very best. Oh, let's put it that way. Unless you had limited space in the space. Exactly. <laughs> I, or it's just like let's get just the superlatives. He would not necessarily go up as the best example, but he might go up as an example. But go ahead. One, and I saw the protest. It was a lot of single women. It wasn't a lot of men. And the men there, they weren't exquisite specimens, let's, be, <laughs> let's face it. But I saw a lot of young, angry females. And the Democratic Party, in a way has become the party of young, angry, single women, right? They're, they place abortion before babies. Right. It's their right to have convenience up to the birth abortion on demand up to birth. That is not a party for a family. That's not a, that's a psychosis. If you think you can abort a child up to the day of birth, that's that's insane. That's insane. So I think the Republican Party should focus on being the party for parents. It's right there. It's a real battle. The facts are there. Do it. Reclaim. Reclaim. Don't get framed. Don't get framed. Don't Reclaim. Get framed. Insane in the membrane. Don't start rapping. <laughs> we gotta go to break. Tone look. Um, well, first off, the um, I think if he was to do a little bit of, um, of 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 googling, he would find that there are many, many married women with children who get abortions. Um, all of them. Um, in fact, the typical abortion patient is already a mother. That is just the, uh, reality, but, um, but this is nothing new with, 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 uh, the, the conservative right wingers. The, you know, 15 years ago, it was uh, Rush Limbaugh talking about the feminization of America. Yeah, Sandra Fluke. Yep. Um, and uh, yes, Stantra is right. Insane in the Membrane is not uh, Tone Loke. It is Cypress Hill. Uh, that is one of, uh, I know that because I think that music came out in the early 90s. That's so right. then yep. I, that's why I know that. But um, it's fascinating how they think demonizing and it's interesting when you when you combine this they are demonizing um i guess young women in their 20s is what, what how he would define it um saying that they're single as a some type of strategy to i mean you have to ask like why does he say this it's not it's first off it's not true right typical abortion patient is in her late 20s is already a mother. Um, and why is he saying this? He's saying this because it will inspire the old people who watch him on television to come out and vote. But those people are already coming. They're, they're like, they're, there's not a lot of movement with those people. And they just don't have any answer. I mean, it's the same thing they're doing with like uh, the, the college debt relief. Everybody, everybody in the sound of my voice probably knows at least one person who is saddled with college debt, if, they, if not themselves. And they know that it's not the people who studied uh, some esoteric, made up, you know, basket weaving gender studies at uh, Bennington or whatever it is, or Oberlin. Uh, is the typical person with student debt. No, it's a lot of people who, who got student debt because, really, because they wanted to earn more money in the workplace. And yet, they persist on this because 
of who their audience is, an increasingly older audience. And, and this also speaks to like why you have so many people who believe that Donald Trump won the election because they are within such a hermetically sealed bubble and they are played to so exclusively like they really these people really do think that the student debt was just to relieve people who were you know taking basket weaving uh, gender study gendered basket weaving in college or something uh or that but but it's easier to believe that the election was stolen than like the student loan stuff because like you said a lot of these people have kids or know somebody who had kids who had to finance their education they're still paying for it yeah uh, it's fascinating. Lib Todd, Sam, you are not uncomfortable at all with the sounding like a censorious social conservative with respect to Instagram saying minors should be protected from access to social media. Seems analogous to Tipper Gore and Twisted Sisters, second wave sex negative feminism, anti porn cr crusading. Aren't leftist uh, people who smoked Marlboro Reds in junior high school? Um, I uh, am not concerned about the um, some specific content. I am concerned about a device that is designed to um, to ger generate uh, brain chemicals in your head, um, having a, a, a bad impact on on fourteen year olds and younger. Yeah. So I don't think that is, uh, it has nothing to do with social conservatism at all. It literally like, am I a social conservative? Cause I think jewel jewels should be banned. Maybe I also had no problem with getting rid of trans fats in food that was being sold. Yeah, I had no problem with, you know, and even, even though I was a smoker, I had no problem with like saying it can't be in, in, in bars, let's say. I'm pretty sure like Mark Zuckerberg doesn't allow, and if you look at those, a lot of like high ranking people in tech don't let their kids do that stuff. And like if from what they're, from their perspective of what they know is we need to hold off and like tell these kids are like 15 or something like that. Yeah. Like, I think it's unhealthy. I really do. Um, and it's not a question of the actual content. It's really more how the pla the, the mechanism plays with children uh whose brains have not developed um so i don't i don't think there's a i don't think that there's a um you know w why don't we let kids smoke you can measure you can measure the uh the implications the health implications i think we can measure the health implications of of what social media is doing to children in terms of anxiety and in terms of uh, body dysmorphia, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm okay with that. I am okay with that. Uh, let's go into the IMs here. Oh no, let's let's do this one. Um, this is also, you know, we saw that that South Carolina. We we, we played a uh, speech from a South Carolina uh, lawmaker who did not understand the implications of voting for that six week uh, abortion ban. And he was speaking out against a uh, South Carolina bill that would have stripped all exceptions from it. That failed to pass. It turned out South Carolina, too much pressure. They did, however, sort of like ramp up their existing six week ban. And, um, and again, those existing exceptions, I guarantee you that guy is going to be back. We're going to play a clip of him eventually. Maybe it's already happened where he says the exceptions, they don't work either. When they start to realize exactly what the implications are of this. Here's another one that I hadn't contemplated, but it makes sense. Again, you can't prove, you're not going to be able to like prove um, rape within a six week window, you're not going to be able to, uh, always measure the threat to a, uh, a pregnant person's life from their pregnancy. 
you're not going to be able to uh, always hear about incest. Um, these exceptions are useless. Here is uh, a story from, um, oh, wait, this is just a news article, right? Uh, I thought, I'm sorry, I thought this. Um, there are women in Alabama who are being kept in prison essentially to, um, in, a, in, a, in an Alabama jail, ostensibly to um, protect fetuses. Under normal circumstances, the 23-year-old from Gazden, uh, this is... Um, Ashley Banks is the, her name. Ashley Banks. They arrested her on May 25th. She had a small amount of marijuana and a pistol without a permit to carry. I didn't know that that was illegal to have a, a pistol in Alabama without a permit. That'll change eventually, I, I can assure you. Read some great uh, Twitter threads about uh, kids at their first day of school and in those places where, you know, uh, you can uh, just uh, open carry. Just guys walking down the street in front of schools with weapons. Just uh, you can't stop them. And just terrifying the kids. Bunch of lockdowns on that first day. Anyways, um, under normal circumstances, the 23-year-old from Gadsden would have been able to post bond and leave jail until her criminal trial. But Banks admitted to smoking pot on the same day she was found out she was pregnant, two days before her arrest. In Etowah County, that meant she couldn't leave jail unless she entered drug rehab, leaving her in limbo for three months. Apparently in Alabama now, several pregnant women and new moms accused of exposing their fetuses to drugs have been held for weeks or months inside the Etowah uh, County Detention Center under special bond conditions that require rehab and $10,000 worth of cash. Oh, that's easy. Yep. Um, they're holding both pregnant and postpartum women in the jail. Aside from the completely a scientific uh, assessment that it is better to keep a woman in jail for the health of the fetus. All the stress that's gener uh, generated. Great environment for maternity. Um, and all those stress hormones. But the idea that you can be imprisoned follows, I mean, look, if you can be imprisoned, which eventually we will get there, if not, we're there already for seeking an abortion, you certainly, it simply follows if the fetus or the embryo has prominence over the person who is carrying that embryo. And I do mean person because a person has rights. A fetus and embryo, they may be alive in some fashion, though they are not viable on their own. They don't have rights because they're not born yet. They're not people yet, but these people can be just kept in jail. The, the, we're going to, this is, this is not, this is not, this is not something that's just an outlier. This is going to be the norm in, I would imagine at least half of the states that have abortion bans, at least within, I don't know, within a year, just, I'm just uh, I'm picking arbitrary numbers. But the fact is, is that like, it only follows and they will press this point. They will press it. If they get control of the Senate and the House, they will they will make this law of the land. There's no doubt about it. And so I don't know those uh, Greg Gutfeld single women who are mad. Yeah. I mean, if I was somebody who could get pregnant, well, I mean, I'm mad about it, and I'm not somebody who can get pregnant. 
this it's just incredible um basically making these women and people who can get pregnant second class citizens whose rights are subservient to someone else's religious uh fundamentalist values that's all that's going on here yeah but Hugh Hewitt says it's not disruptive not disruptive at all that's why um Starry decisis carries the day. Um, yeah, you'll be saved that, that by that thing that was just bowled over recently. <laughs> Let's talk about this. Uh, I'm no fan of Sam Harris's or Dave Rubin's for that matter. I'm not even sure uh, like, even why we're talking about this, but um, Sam Harris is a guy who doesn't seem to understand, uh, have any sense of politics whatsoever. And um, is so immersed in, I, I think this guy so appreciates the sound of his own voice that he says things without really thinking about them a lot of times or without contemplating the implications of them. Um, with that said, uh, Dave Rubin's also uh, a, a total moron who, even if he was to spend time about the things he would uh, was talking coming out of his mouth, he wouldn't understand them. Uh, so this is sort of a, uh, a fun back and forth. Um, play this. Uh, there was a clip that apparently went viral about two weeks ago. Oh, positive. Uh, this, this is, is, this is um, uh, Dave Rubin talking about Sam Harris was on a uh, show called what trigger on it the trigger the trigger nometry yeah. podcast and what is so what is this about like people are like people get triggered by well stuff it's and, like it, it's no two, like, it's like two fledgling comedians yeah right? it's two and, comedians and it's like they don't say anything about like we want to trigger you it's like we just want to have honest conversations honest like, okay. discourse oh thank God but We're this able. is yeah this is a uh, Ruben coming back after a, a of uh, oh so the, he's catching up on things. yeah I exactly see. okay is Sam Harris uh, on the uh, Trigonometry podcast, which I've done the Trigonometry podcast. I consider those guys uh, friends. They're, they're doing some good stuff over there. It's a British podcast, and they, they do a lot of similar stuff that we do here. I bet. Uh, anyway, Sam went on uh, to defend censorship and getting Trump off Twitter and why we shouldn't care about Hunter Biden's laptop and a whole bunch of other stuff. So this is Sam a couple weeks ago. Listen, I don't care what's in Hunter Biden's life. I mean, Hunter Biden, at that point, Hunter Biden literally could have had, had the corpses of children in his basement. I would not have cared, right? It's like, it's, there's nothing. First of all, it's Hunter Biden, right? It's not, it's like, it's not Joe Biden. But even if Joe, like, even the, whatever scope of Joe Biden's corruption is, like, if, you, if we could just go down that rabbit hole endlessly and, and, understand that he's getting kickbacks from Hunter Biden's deals in Ukraine or wherever else, right? Or China. It is infinitesimal compared to the corruption we know Trump is involved in. It's like, pause it's like, it for it's like a second. A now, I uh, personally would have real issues with Joe Biden getting kickbacks from Hunter Biden for his stuff. And, and really the, the operative point is you know, like, uh, look, Sam Harris can, is, is happy to choose. If, if I had to choose between uh, Trump and Biden, I would vote for Biden. Not because um, I don't think that, um, you know, Biden getting kickbacks, which the real point is he didn't. Mm -hmm. um, is because a president really is just a, a head of um, a, a group of people who will enter into government. Yeah, it's a figurehead for a coalition, and you pick which coalition is best, and that's never a difficult... <laughs> exactly. I mean, that's the bottom line. Like, I, I, don't, I don't care if Joe Biden's a nice guy or a bad guy. I don't care about what, you know, like, who he is in any way. And frankly, I never cared any difference between Donald Trump. Ron DeSantis, just as bad as Donald Trump is, in my mind. I mean, yes, Trump may be more criminal. Maybe, maybe, than Ron DeSantis. I don't want to uh, besmirch Ron DeSantis. Yeah, it's open competition. Uh, it's open competition. But the, the, pre the petty criminality of Donald Trump is not my problem with Donald Trump. My problem with Donald Trump is he does the bidding of the Republican Party. 
largely, almost uh, maybe exclusively. <laughs> I mean, and everybody he puts in there are the worst of the worst of the Republican Party. That's the point. But Harris in sort of like classic Sam Harris fashion is like, not helping. Well, not helping, but also like what's really important is my, uh, in, when I talk about politics is my freedom of expression about sort of like formulating, you know, my, uh, personal philosophical. I mean, it really is. I mean, this is the same guy who like, again, writes in Huffington post and you use your own titles then incidentally. I think it was literally like in defense of torture. And it was for him, it was just a philosophical um, sort of meandering about uh, torture. But it, he wrote that on one of the biggest platforms that existed at the time in the midst of a huge debate about torture in this country. As if like, oh, I, I'm allowed because I, you know, got a PhD to operate in a total vacuum that is uh, divorced from, from politics. But uh, continue. Compared to the corruption we know Trump is involved in. It's like, it's like, it's like a firefly to the sun, right? I mean, like, there, there's just, it doesn't even, it doesn't even stack up against Trump University, right? Trump University as a story is worse than anything that could be in, in Hunter Biden's laptop, in my view, right? Now that's not, that doesn't answer the people who say it's still completely unfair to not have looked at the laptop in a timely way and to have shut down the, you know, the New York Post's Twitter account. Like that, that's a, just a conspiracy, that's a left-wing conspiracy to deny the presidency to Donald Trump. Absolutely it was, absolutely, right? But I think it was warranted, right? And, I'm, and again, it's a coin toss as to whether or not- Sam, I'm sorry. That particular piece I'm, I'm is, really yeah. sorry. I, I was the one that said we should move yeah, yeah. on, but you've just oh, said yeah. something I really struggle with it. there, which is the you kid, support- the, kid, the, kid, the kids in the basement? You, no, no, <laughs> fuck the kids in the basement. I'm interested yeah. in democracy. You're saying you are content with a left-wing conspiracy to prevent somebody being democratically re-elected as president. Well, no, I'm, I'm content. Well, so it's, but the thing is, it's just not left-wing, right? So Liz Cheney is not what? left-wing. Wait, what? Yeah. I pause. Liz- he, he, he literally just did say it was a left-wing conspiracy. Cool. First of all, it's not, it's not a left-wing conspiracy. Um, Twitter... Jack Dorsey, not a left-wing person. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg, by, Joe Kaplan, no. Not no, these are not. And the New York Post. The other th- sort of amazing thing about this is that, like, there was nothing there that they could present. The, um, the, the laptop is real. It exists. It was out there. There was not. They were never able to make it mean anything other than Hunter Biden was an F-up. When you have control of the highest rating uh, cable television show in the country and um, things like Fox News and uh, the Post and whatnot, um, if you have a problem with Twitter shutting down accounts, what you need to do is make Twitter not so relevant within the conversation by not essentially allowing any private corporation to become the town square. And the thing that you get from the right here, whether it's, and and by right, I mean the libertarian brain, whether it's Dave Rubin or Glenn Greenwald or whatnot is, they're not going to make it about the structure that disallows a private corporation from being the town hall, from having dominance over what we hear. They're going to make it about the, they're just playing the refs here. That's all they're doing. They're just playing the refs. They have no problem with corporations essentially taking over the public square. They have no problem with corporations taking over the role of government. I mean, right. right? Like we give a monopoly of authority to the government. They have no problem with giving corporations monopoly of authority over what we say, because and the only way you can inhibit 
that from happening is to not allow them to have a monopoly because you cannot have the government go in and they would be against this in a moment. If the government started to regulate and say, you cannot have a social media platform and disallow anything. The idea that the government could come in and say, as soon as the valuation for Facebook tanks and the valuation for Google tanks and the valuation for all of these companies tank, these right-wingers would be like, whoa, 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 wait a second. And they would tank because if they were full of, let's say, calls for pedophilia, calls for the elimination of Jews, let's say. If they became the cesspools that they would have them become, people would just leave. People would just leave. And they would go to a platform where they could go and not have to see that kind of stuff. And then the problem would replicate itself. But they, that's not, their agenda is not to have freedom of expression or to not be. Uh, sort of excluded from the town hall. Their, their agenda is to make themselves feel aggrieved and to attack different institutions that they can... And, and, and I guarantee you in two or three years, it'll be something different. They'll have moved on to some other thing. This is just more convenient. But continue. Cheney You'll is doing everything in her power. You're contending with a conspiracy to prevent somebody no, being democratically it's not a, No, but there's nothing, conspiracy, it's not, it, it was a conspiracy out in the open, it does, but it doesn't matter if it was, a, it doesn't matter what part's conspiracy, what part's out in the open. Okay, so there is a lot to unpack there, as Sam would say. So first off, I want to just say something. Sam and I were friends for many years. I'm not really sure if we're friends anymore to be quite honest with you and it, it doesn't really matter and i'm not going to attack him personally here i'm just simply not going to do that uh seven years ago this week in 2015 i think this was on september 12 2015 we launched the rubin report uh as this show and uh as an interview show at first and then ultimately what became this sam was my first guest wow. um, so he's been an integral part and in, i would say my own political evolution as many of you know and i wrote about it don't burn this book you know, Sam on real time with Bill Maher when he got into that fight with Ben Affleck, uh, as Sam was calmly talking about the difference between Hi. criticizing ideas. In this case, here? he was talking about ideas about religion. Yeah, you know, we could probably end it there. I mean, all he does is say how sad it is that Sam Harris. He doesn't was, say he doesn't have any critique of it. He's basically like he, Sam's gone crazy. He's gone over into too into Trump derangement syndrome, unlike those other people who are making the right move, like Joe Rogan. That's basically the video. Um. I mean, I think Harris actually sort of was like a little bit disturbed by the fact that he, uh, at one point he realized like in 2016 or 2017, like, oh my gosh, all somehow the audience I've collected with, um, uh, my Islamophobia right now, like, I mean, that was like seven years ago. And I would imagine if we would go back and watch that Dave Rubin, Sam Harris clip, it would be about how the massive threat that the Muslim world presents to us. That would probably be, I would say, the, if I had to guess, like what the entire interview uh, uh, pivoted around. Now, somehow that's just dissolved. Yeah, I bet there were even caveats saying all fundamentalism is bad and religious extremism maybe a little bit. Maybe. But, but that's but definitely I gone I can now. tell you at that time that uh, Sam Harris's speaking tour was at the, uh, was at like, I think the majority of his spots were like literally sponsored by brotherhoods of, uh, of temples around the country, of, of, of Jewish synagogues. But put that aside. Um, the, the, the bottom line is, is that like, Harris was never... <laughs> Uh, anybody who sort of like whose analysis of politics or any of these things were even were either historical or contextualized in a proper way. Um, was there um, uh, an attempt to um, diminish the importance of the the Biden uh, notebook? I mean, a uh, uh, laptop, of course. Um, just like there was an attempt to diminish 
all of Donald Trump's moves. I mean, that's yeah. what happens in a political campaign. It's it's uh, documented that like Facebook internally was looking at different sorts of moderation thing for right wing extremism, and people like Joe Kaplan, executives at Facebook, um, found out that actually we're in this dragnet for hate. We're uh, picking up a bunch of like Republican uh, candidates for Congress, so we need to pull back on moderation. This is all work in the refs, right? Like that's that's why they feel compelled to do it. It's not because they're secret Democrats or radicals. It's because they're worried about the perception of their company because perception isn't there's a like the the idea that conservatives think that these uh companies are just attacking them when like ben shapiro camps at the top of trending list all the time and uh, i i just think it's a it's a it's crazy yeah it is crazy and uh again like it is um i think that the hunter biden story uh um i think it was completely irrelevant to Joe Biden's presidential run in many respects, but I have no problem with that getting out there any more than I did with like, you know, Billy Carter's, uh, you know, taking a pee outdoors uh, impact, you know, uh, uh, being reported on that. Yes. Family members of, of, of politicians get discussed all the time. Do I think it would have made a difference in the election? No, not at all. I think what happened probably made the Hunter Biden laptop a bigger story than it was would have been anyway. Without a doubt. Without a doubt. Joe Biden wasn't even in office at that time. Joe, that's the thing that people forget. Like, he was a former vice president that no one thought at that time was going to be back into office. No one. Yeah, like pre, I almost, I almost feel like pre, even like fe late February 2020, there was like no, he was kind of considered like dead in the water and kind of yep. almost like a joke relative yep. to everybody else. Yep. Um, let's go to the IMs. So Sam takes a day off. The Queen dies. I'm sure it's just a coincidence. Teterboro, not Peterborough. Oh, whatever. I don't care. Uh, death is a door, but time is but a window. I'll be back. Vigo the Carpathian, Carpathian, Ghostbusters too. Okay. Uh, Calvin from Northville. Good afternoon, you weirdos. Uh, Bertolt Mech. Oh my gosh, this is inappropriate, but I saw like a um, audio of this. Na uh, na na na. Lizzie's in a box. Uh, they were singing that in like some Irish. Uh, yeah, yeah. That was. I mean. Yeah, the Irish are really uh, some some some. Pocket I mean, you know, to be fair, oh, of course, uh, I mean, they had some beef. Yeah, uh, I have no question. Know, they had some beefs. Uh, we'll just read some IMs and we'll get out of here. I didn't realize what time it was. No new Prince of Wales. For Godwin ni eto yima o hid simru am bith. I I I have no idea. I don't know what that means. Uh, who's laughing now, Sam? You mentioned Adam Kokesh after your Libertarian debate the other day, and I have two stories about him. One of them involves a girl I know who he tried hooking up with. I'm at a 618 number. I'll try and get in right when the lines open up. Well, I have to do that on Monday. I'm sorry. El Conniption. I get so excited every time I see an MR notification featuring Ben Dixon. Please ask him if he's putting out any more music. Sam, in your remarks about the queen living nearly a century, I see why you always pull your listeners toward an understanding that substantive societal change accrues over an incredibly long period of time. I'm also convinced you're going to live to 100 doing the MR on a regular, uh, considering you drink the blood of libertarians, like it's out of a big gulp. Pharma Phil. Hello, MR crew and family. Uh, September is Suicide Awareness Month. I'm also trying to raise money for mental health. Also, for every dollar I raise, my company will match it. Please go to my latest post on my Twitter, at P-H-A-R-M-E-R Phil 27. Farmer is spelt with a PH. Thank you very much. Farmer Phil 27. Reminder, new COVID boosters are available. Getting mine this afternoon. I, I, they haven't been, the COVID boosters <clears throat> weren't coming into uh, the pharmacy I usually go to. So I got my flu shot yesterday. Um, I know some people getting it uh, simultaneously. I'll probably get my booster sometime next week if I can get a I, CVS, I bet, has them or something like that. But yes, good idea to get your booster. Also, very good idea to get the flu shot. Remember, it's been a couple of years since you've been as exposed as you're going to be uh, in the next couple of months. I didn't get sick at all since February 2019. I haven't gotten a single cold 
The one time I felt sick, uh, it turned out to be COVID. And um, which shows you, A, COVID much easier to catch than uh, other um, uh, viruses. And B, I, I mean, I don't know if I'm ever going to go on the subway without a mask ever again. Like, I'm not crazy uh, uh, mask wearing. Like, my son is out of control with it. Uh, still, <laughs> he's the only one. He doesn't care. Um, but if I'm, if I'm going to go into a store, if I'm going to run into a store and I know, like, I'm only going to be in there for 60 seconds, I'm not as worried about it. But if I'm going into, like, a place where, like, if I'm going into, like, the bagel shop and there's a long line, and, you know, these things aren't uh, big places. I'll wear my mask in there. And, and these days, you know, there's only going to be like two or three other people, who, you know, out of like 10, let's say. But at least you don't feel like everybody's staring at you because everybody gets it. He just wants to wear his mask. Uh, Judy Rulliani, so casual that all buttons are loose on that collar. North Dakota Llama. Um Let's see. It reminds me of all the Civil War lost causers calling Grant a lazy drunk who simultaneously organized massacres of Confederate soldiers. <laughs> Kelly from California. Great to see Matthew is on a program. As a member of his film class, I highly recommend anyone interested to join us next session. There are wonderful people in the group from all over the world. Interesting movies that are hard to find. Informative discussion left is best. Professor Dumpster Fire, ignoring the easy boomer jokes at Sam's expense. It's been really scary to see how quickly TikTok speed ran the Gamergate misogyny pipeline, and it makes me seriously wonder what my life would be like if my parents had let me make a Facebook account before I was in high school. I had to use old school forums to be social online because I wasn't allowed social media, and one of my favorite websites basically imploded during Gamergate, and I think about that all the time. Perfectly normal people I knew in high school turned into chud weirdos after that whole ordeal. I it would be perfectly fine with kids going on uh, bulletin boards and and communicating. What I think is problematic is likes. Um, I think that's bad. I think making you know the gamification and the practice of commodification uh, on these social media platforms and the algorithms, I would just outlaw them. I would outlaw them and I would, I would just say, you gotta be, you gotta be 14. Like look at you, uh, on, on YouTube, we've got to put not for a under 18 year olds. You could tighten that up. You could tighten that stuff up. Dan from Columbia, y'all use senior bats in your softball league, Sam. <laughs> I don't know what that means, but no. I'm in Los Angeles. I had a triple. First at bat, triple. And I'm so slow. I should have I should have been a home run. A guy I have a little bit of a competition with who's got a mouth on him. I'm not gonna say his name, Lou. Um he's at shortstop and he immediately starts yelling to everybody because uh, I haven't been there in a while. He starts yelling that I'm a pull hitter. <laughs> Which in the most part is is probably true. But he was kind of saying you're not going to like right, he just said, crack it. Pull, pull, and, you know, to get people to shift. Right. And I was like, and I looked at him and I said, pull? <laughs> just right down the right field line. It, it was so, it was one of the most satisfying things I've, I've experienced in like four months, I feel like. Are inside the parkers relatively common or do people hit it out of the, out of the park, so to speak? Or is it? I mean, there's four outfielders more often than not. Oh, okay. And a lot of these guys have real legs. And you know what to expect with a lot of batters by the time they come up now. Right. We're not in a league. We're like a, a pickup game. There's like about 25 of us who rotate in. So you kind of like you are, have experience with each other. So, you, you know, it's gappers unless you really get a hold of one and, uh, and you're fast. When I am not uh, fast. Um Bunker Inspector, you're lucky you're in America. In Ireland, we'll be hearing the Brits go on about the Queen for weeks. They're having 10 day of mourning and cancel the soccer over the weekend. I never want to hear about their stiff upper lip and their keep calm and carry on BS. They're historical ba babies who choose the head of state by the first person to pop out of the last person's vagina. <laughs> I mean, where's the lie? Bullprog, Sam's mic could use a notch filter at 250 megahertz when his rig's cooling system kicks in. 
Someday, Bullprog, you can tell us what that means. <laughs> Jess from the West. Hi, all. My short stint of unemployment comes to a close on Monday. I moved to, up to Vegas earlier this week to come out and teach. Honestly, I feel like half of the eight-hour drive was taken up with Sam's Libertarian debate on Wednesday. Hoping I can still catch the show on my new schedule. Thanks for the content. Have a good one. Congratulations, Jess. On the new job. Diglo Lefty. Hey, Sam, I'm currently here in San Diego where we're surrounded by wildfires to the north and east and a tropical storm from the west. It's like we're caught in the middle of a battle between elemental-powered comic book characters. Oy, good luck. Wonder Bredder. Sam, living in Georgia since birth, most of the right-wingers here have literally zero interest in politics at all. They only care about white Christian nationalism. They always have. You should have heard all the racist shit I heard everywhere when uh, Obama was in. My hometown still flies the old Georgia CSA flag on its uh, foremost highest mast. Atlanta and the college towns are the only resistance to that as well. It's economic grown, uh, bringing it growth, bringing in more educated people. Uh, Anarcho PMC, American Fascist by Chris Hedges, is a must read on the topic of Christian nationalism. The Fungo Half. Damn, Sam's got some name three songs energy going. 100% sure what that means. Jay from Columbus. Hi, I'm our crew. I just got hit with my second bout of COVID a few days before I was planning on getting the new boosters. I'm doing okay, but body aches are crazy. Stay safe and get boosted. Left is best. Good uh, uh, suggestion. All right, three more. Uh, Kowalski from Nebraska. Great show on the boys Friday. Sam, we need an agricultural update. How are the apples and cucumbers? I'm also mailing the office some baby chickens. An Australian in the left reckoning discord has convinced me the future egg sales could pay for your air conditioning needs. Have a wonderful weekend. Can't find the article, but uh, read apparently a think tank projected that a minor baby boom is expected in about 12 months thanks to the student debt forgiveness. I believe it was something to the effect of 25 to 35 year olds who are putting off starting a family feel much better. I I'd buy that. Um, apples not doing good this year. The heat was just destroyed a lot of my fruit trees. B big time, big time. Uh, peaches were anemic, uh, but this is what the worst part was. The birds, the birds attacked the peaches and the grapes this year. And all they do is like, they take one hit out of it. They don't even like to eat it. They take one hit out. And I think it's just to get the water it was so dry up there. Cucumbers did okay for a while, and then they just got too fried. And it wasn't for lack of water. I think it was literally they got burnt. But I grew for the first time this year uh, salt and pepper uh, cucumbers, which are yellow, sort of like, um, what do you call it? Uh, not gherkin. What is it? Uh, uh, what's the, it starts with a K. Oh, God, I can't even. You know, like um, Kirby. They oh, look cool. like yellow Kirby uh, cucumbers. And they're the best. I'm never going to go green again. Never. All right, two more. But I'm going to plant some trees soon. Road Rider. I miss Freaky Phone Friday. Ah, uh -huh. yeah, I knew you would. And the final I am of the day of the week. Congressional baseball fan. It's been a while. I don't have much to say about the queen, but I'm sure my cousin, parliamentary cricket enthusiast, does. Bradley, Matt, Emma, and Abstentia, Binder and Brandon, good job this week. See you on Monday. It might take a street black guy to get to where I want, but I know somehow I'm going to get there. I wasn't looking when I just got caught Between the truth and the light bar But finding out won't make me feel any better Yeah, I know the clock is ticking But the meds are gonna kick in And my pilot light shining bright I guess I'm where the choice is for the option where you don't get paid For the road that bends before it finally breaks you I
Yeah.